What's going on, everybody? This is Brian Mazik, a.k.a. Unique Mazik, the hardest working man in sports and gaming. And I'm here again with my man, Nelson Blake, the second. What's going on, man? I am doing pretty great, man. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. I'm blessed and highly favored and everything is getting better every minute that I continue to breathe. Well, that's all about to change in the next couple of hours. Oh, no, cool. look at this. Look, look at this. Look at this devil trying to work. <laughs> <laughs> this is at me, bro, in case y'all didn't know. And I'm about to start spitting some bars, it sounds like, because that rhymes. So I felt like I <laughs> felt like I was about to get my Toby and Wigway on there. Oh. Yeah. Ah. Put them in there again. Slide them in. Whoop. See, you, you, dish. You, from, you from Chicago. I don't hear enough Lupe props out of you. I'm a little disgusted. I, I like Lupe. I do like Lupe. But, uh, you know, Toby's he, the man right now for me. He, he ain't no Lupe. He, he, he the man. I mean, I like, I like Lupe a lot, but he's yeah. the man right now for me. You know, Toby's the dude. But I want to start this off by just, uh, you know, uh, giving a shout out to our subscribers. We reached 200 subscribers just before we went to record this particular episode. So I am very thankful. I'm sure I, I speak for Nelson uh, and Portia as well. When I say that, uh, that's a nice, that's like one of our first little milestones or whatever. Uh, so we definitely appreciate that and hope to continue to grow. Uh, so if you like, you know, like we always say, if you like what you hear, like what you see, make sure that you, uh, you know, you like it, subscribe, and then also share it as well. So Let's jump right into the first thing we're going to talk about today. And I'm going to tell y'all right now, we're going to be talking about a lot of basketball today. So if you like basketball and you like the way we discuss it, you're probably in the right place. So I got a question for you, Nelson. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that you have an answer that I find suitable. Um, because if I don't find it suitable, I'll definitely let you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> I would like to hear your top five point guards in the NBA today. Okay. Today. Well, no, today. Th this this uh, answer depends largely on whether or not you consider James Harden a point guard. Uh, James Harden played the point guard position for an entire year, and he plays the point guard position whenever Chris Paul is hurt. Um, so if James Harden – is James Harden a point guard, yes or no? I, I, don't, I don't consider him a point guard. I consider him a ball controller, but you know, I don't think he's any more of a point. <laughs> he was played literally at the point guard position for a year, and the offense forms to that. I, I I know there's a crossover between what he does and what Giannis and LeBron do. Like there's kind of a point yeah. forward element to him, but I also think he, if he's asked to, he could go to any team and be a legitimate point guard. Well, I, yeah, I mean, I think that. Giannis and he's and done Le that in the past. I so, think Giannis and LeBron could too, but I, I do think that he, uh, what, here's what I think. Here's why I'm willing to say yes, I'll give him that love as a point guard because if you look at the starting five that goes on the floor with him, mm -hmm. there is no other player on the floor, as, when, except for when Chris Paul is playing, it, that you can say is the point guard. Right. You know, so and, last and year I would say, he, a lot. <laughs> yeah, last year I would say that that's who he was. This year it's a little bit blurred with Chris Paul coming back from injury, but okay. Well, I mean, you know, we'll, 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 I'll allow it. <laughs> I'll All allow right. It. So, uh, let me just double check something. Okay. So, um, my list is right now currently based on the idea of, what the point guard is supposed to do, which is run the offense and make their teammates better. Uh -huh. And in that list, I have number one is Steph Curry. Number two is James Harden. Number three is Russell Westbrook. Number four is Kyrie Irving. And number five is Damian Lillard. And that's my top five. Um, so wait a minute. Can you repeat your criteria again? Uh, they run the offense and they make their teammates better. <sighs> they run the offense and they make their teammates better. Yeah, and there's different there's different ways to do that. Now, so for instance, the Kyrie Irving is the one on this list that, in that element, I think could be considered a little shaky, um, because Boston seems to be better without him. Uh, but, however, that's not necessarily true. There's a lot of numbers that say that's not true. Mm -hmm. um, and I think most importantly, and if people watch this show, if you watch them hang out our other show, you guys know I actually have been very critical of Kyrie Irving. But I also say 
young point guards, yada, 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 because of his injuries, he has less years than a guy his age normally does. Um, they develop, and Kyrie Irving has become a better playmaker this year. I do think, eventually, Boston is better with him. And I don't mean that, like, down the road. I mean, like, during the course of the game, there's times where Boston might get stagnant when he's not out there and he's able to get buckets. And at the end of the game, most importantly, they're a better team with Kyrie Irving on the floor because without Kyrie Irving on the floor, they can struggle against better teams in the last few minutes uh, to get points and stuff like that. But with Kyrie Irving on the floor, they always have a chance to beat literally any team in the league. And, and that's an important way to make your team better. I don't think Kyrie is as good and making his team better as the other guys before him on that list, as Steph, uh, James, and Russell. I think for 48 minutes, Oklahoma City, Houston, and Golden State are better for having those guys on the floor. For Kyrie, I think it's inconsistent from game to game and during the game, but very consistently at the end of the game, they're a better team with him on the floor. And they just have to continue to grow and figure out in their situation. I think their situation is bigger than Kyrie Irving. And it is worth noting that last year when Kyrie Irving was healthy, they won 18 games in a row. So, you know, so that's my list. Um, and it is partially based on the fact that with the exception of Steph Curry, talent wise, those teams are all in somewhat similar situations, right? Now uh -huh. Houston hasn't been healthy, so their record could get another a bit of forgiveness, but they all have basically one other all-star talent level player and a bunch of really good role players. And, you know, according to that criteria, I could have put Russell number two, but Russell's having such a bad shooting year that I wouldn't do that, even though he's having such a good defensive year that you could make that argument too. And I think that's the problem with Kyrie is that Kyrie can be such a bad defensive player at times that it's better to have Terry Rozier on the floor. And he has to work on that and clean that up. But that doesn't outbalance the fact that Kyrie is one of the best one-on-one -on -one scorers in the league and arguably the best clutch scorer overall, regular season and playoffs, right? Like, Steph is great in regular season, but in the playoffs, we still haven't really seen him be at his best in the biggest moments. But Kyrie is just an absolute straight killer. So that's my list. Okay. Well, I'm sad I, to leave Kemba Walker off the list, but his team don't never do nothing. Well, see, that's just I don't know how fair that is, but let's just let's 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 just go about this. Like, so I first of all, I find fault. <laughs> I find I find inconsistency and I find fault in your criteria and the matching of your list. And I did hear your explanation and how you kind of try to link that up. But I think that the glue that you are using to sync those two concepts together is very faulty. It is far from Gorilla Glue because you said that they need to make their teams better. But you also gave examples of how Kyrie fails to do that in certain situations. But then in other situations, it appears that he does, which to me creates a sense of inconsistency. So. That but is the I, reason. I said he's inconsistent. Can I get a 22nd time? I'm just saying. Out. I said that. I said that. That's why he's not at the top of the list, but he doesn't have to be on the list. He's not on my list. Okay. All right. Okay. This, he's not on my list. So I think that's fair, too. It, it, he, it, you doggone right it is. I'm looking at my list right now, and it is fairly, his name is fairly omitted. No, he's not fairly. It's completely omitted. Now, I, we agree with number one. Steph Curry, I do have him number one, uh, which is different for me this particular year because I've had the gentleman that I have dropped down to number four on my list as number one. Is that Chris uh, Paul? But can I get to my? Can I do my list? Can I? Can if, if Derek Rose ain't on his list, I don't, did know, I, I don't even did know. Did I? Did I attempt <laughs> to leapfrog any portion of your I'm, list? I'm so sorry. Go ahead. I bro. did not do it. Okay, I didn't. I let you do your thing. I'm surprised you didn't put Emmanuel Mugier and Frank Dillakeen on here. But anyway, number two, based off your criteria, which you've already started to break the rules at the very beginning of the show, James Harden. I have James Harden, number two. All right. Number three, I have Russell Westbrook. Uh, for some of the things that you mentioned, yes, he is shooting the ball horrible. He can't shoot a Skittle in the ocean. 
right now. He can't. But defensively, he is playing fantastic. He is creating for his team. And we cannot forget the fact that he is the best rebounding point guard in the NBA, maybe ever. Right. This is what he is doing. And he's still getting to the basket, still getting to the free throw line, even though he's not making free throws the way he usually does. But he's, he's still picking that up. He's still finding ways to put pressure on the defense in every way, shape, or form. And he's also putting pressure on his uh, his uh, his assignment on a nightly basis. He's the best post up guard in the group. Kyrie's a good post up guard too. Uh, yes. But Rus- Russell is a mismatch in the post. Yes. For, uh, for almost, for most point guards, right? So, number four, I do have Chris Paul. Uh, I know he's been hurt, yeah, and I know that he's had to adjust himself a bit to the way you know because James Harden wants his thirty every night because he's really digging the, the fact that his name keeps coming up in these different conversations. So he's letting James Harden do his thing, and I think it's good for Chris Paul because Chris Paul's biggest issue is durability, and the less weight he has to carry early in the regular season, the more apt potentially he is to be available in the postseason, which is when they really, really need him. So, but I cannot ignore the fact that for the his almost his entire career pretty much he's made guys better overall like you get a rim running big with him and they're going to be better you know you get a dependable wing shooter they're going to get more shots than they get pretty much with just about everybody else they can play with right so Harden is really good running screen and roll, running pick and roll as well, and he's good at finding wing shooters, which is the reason why he's averaging almost eight assists a game or whatever. So he's, he, you know, but it is what it is. I, I have Chris Paul there. And number five, I have Damian Lillard. Okay. Um, I, I like Lillard a little more than Kyrie, even though ne- neither of them are great defenders. I think Lillard, Lillard, Lillard has attempted to step up in that, uh, in that area. Uh, I just, as a as a as a physical presence and as a just like I think they're both great clutch players. I, I don't think Lillard Lillard gets enough credit for his ability to knock down clutch shots. He's also proven oh, he's, that he's he can that he can do it as well too. So um I, I just like Lillard Lillard a little bit better. I don't know why I can't say Lillard today, but <laughs> I like him a little bit better uh over Kyrie. It's very close between those two. It's uh, very close. I used to have Lillard above Kyrie, but mm-hmm. Kyrie's efficiency is so high this year and he's improved as a playmaker. That was always my number one criticism of Kyrie is I, I just can't buy a top flight point guard passing the way he was passing, which was just not, not enough, especially the fact that his, his game is going to the basket. The difference with Lillard is Lillard's game is largely pulling away from the basket. So he's, he's going to not get as many assists. If Lillard went to the basket as much as Kyrie Irving, he would average more assists. You know what yeah. I mean? And Lillard also seems to be a little bit better at sharing the scoring duties with a CJ McCollum type player, which is what Kyrie Irving is struggling with, with Jason yeah. Tatum. Yeah. Um, and, and, but the thing is, despite those troubles and despite what the, what the word is around Boston, they still have a good record. Like they're it's not never- a failing team. They're doing, they're doing fine. You know they still I mean? have a good record. I don't think they have the record that, um, people expected them to have, but they still do have a good record. So I think people form those expectations without a realistic look at the changes made in the Eastern Conference. Um, well, every I, every I, team above them is better than they. Every team around them is better. Than, in fact, every team in the conference is better than they were last year. Brooklyn's better. Detroit's better. Charlotte's better. Uh, Philadelphia is better. Milwaukee's better. Indiana, until uh, El Depot's injury injury was better, and you know what I mean, like. I don't know if I mentioned Milwaukee or Toronto got Kawhi Leonard. Like the whole conference, this is the power conference in a lot of people's eyes now. It literally switched powers despite the fact that LeBron James left. LeBron James left and every team got better. It's very feasible to believe that the Cavs would definitely have not made it it, to the finals or, you know what I mean, in in this Eastern Conference. So you can't judge Boston. They're looking at Boston and they went in their head and they imagined a bunch of things. And I think... That's my biggest criticism of Boston right now is that they're over panicking when they should be saying, hey, we have a plan. We're going to get it together. Gordon Hayward's getting healthy. He's looking better and better. I don't know what people expected, you know, 12 months after his leg popped off and fell into the stands. Like, what you, what you, what you thought this guy was going to turn into? He was yeah. going str- to struggle. 
Yeah, right? and especially especially uh, coming into a team where you know your absence had it basically created opportunities for you know Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum to step up and do big things essentially. Right. And now they have earned a certain amount of playing time. So now you kind of have to get in where you fit in and he's starting to come together with it, but he accepted coming off the bench for a while. You know I mean? So he's, he's definitely, he, he's starting to put it together, yeah. but uh, I do think ultimately he, he probably ends up being the odd man out. I, I'm not a hundred percent sure about that because when he's healthy, He's a guy who plays both sides of the floor, runs the offense really well, and shoots better than most people on that team and can go to the basket. And, and his athleticism is coming back. Like, you can see it. Uh, he's a guy who's a very efficient scorer who works well in that system. I think people are very harshly judging Gordon Hayward because of the performance of the younger guys and how bad it looks when a guy is getting healthy. Yeah, I, I don't think it's even about that. I think it's more about the money. You know, he, his contract is ginormous. And if they can find somebody that will take him and take that deal, uh, I think that just it makes more sense to 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 ride with Jason Tatum and with uh, Jalen Brown. Just it just makes more sense from a financial standpoint, uh, not even talking about what he will or won't be able to to grow into. But I think it just makes a little bit more sense to do that. But, you know, we'll we'll see. We'll see because he, he makes a ton mm -hmm. and, you know. <laughs> so, and I think it definitely he would have probably been included in a deal to get Anthony Davis if they could have done it, you know, at that point. So just kind of make things work from a money standpoint. But, we'll, you know, we'll see. We'll find out uh, moving forward how that goes. Now, um, we have, like I said, quite a bit of, of basketball to talk about. And before, like, uh, we're going to get into some 2K, but I don't want to kind of jump back and forth from real basketball to 2K and then back to real basketball. So let's keep it going on the real basketball. So I'm going to throw a slight curveball here. And let's talk about the Hall of Fame. So the, the Hall of Fame finalist, uh, I believe, did you get a chance to see uh, what, what, you know, what, um, what the Hall of Fame finalists were uh, for this upcoming season? Uh, no. Okay, because there were they dropped uh, the the uh, the you know the class itself hasn't been determined, but Chris Webber, Ben Wallace, uh, they headlined the the finalists for the 2019 uh, class. I mean, th so like I said, these guys are the are the the finalists. They're not in yet, but right. they are the the biggest names basically included. So. Uh, I believe we also have uh, Lita Andrews, um, Hugh Evans, Bill Fitch, Bobby Jones, Sidney Moncrief, Barbara Stevens, Eddie Sutton, Teresa Witherspoon, and like I said, Chris Weber. Uh, let's see, uh, four-time first final, four-time four first-time finalists, which is Marcus Johnson, Jack Sigma, who I have been talking about, should have been in the Hall of Fame for a while. He's like the only seven times. It's only him and Larry Faust are the only uh, people who have been to seven All-Star games or more and not in the Hall of Fame. Um, mm -hmm. Ben Wallace, like I said, and Paul Westfall. So that whole thing got me just kind of thinking, right, about the Hall of Fame and that whole thing. So mm -hmm. there's some guys in the league right now who are, I don't know, they're, they're debatable Hall of Famers in some people's minds. Some people think they're definite Hall of Famers. But what I want to know is I want to know if you think that these people are hall, first ballot Hall of Famers or not. Now, this is supposed to be like a yes or no question, but your name's Nelson Blake and my name's Brian Mazik, and we very rarely do anything in a yes or no type of a situation. Mm -hmm. So I already know we're going to break those rules. Mm -hmm. But... I'm going to throw this question out to you. That's what you got. I'm not even going to start there because I don't want to. I, I would prefer to ease into the, that particular subject. I can tell by the look in your the, eyes. Girl, wait, girl, wait. Up, 20. There's a, there's there a Valen is. Valentine's don't. Day glow about you. Oh, my God. <laughs> He's doing it to me again. This guy <laughs> harasses me via the Internet every week. <laughs> every week he does it, guys. Every week. Pal Gasol. See, you thought I was going to say somebody else. No, no, no. I, I like the pouch. It's first ballot. Clean. No, 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 no questions there. First ballot clean. 
Yeah, yeah. No questions. None whatsoever. Based on what criteria is he a first ballot? I, and I'm not saying that I disagree. I'm just saying based on what criteria is he? Oh, just what he's done in the league and what he's done outside of the league internationally. You know, uh, he's an excellent player all around. He's he's good. His numbers are good. And his accomplishments are, are good. Uh, he's got everything except – I mean, I shouldn't even say except the MVP because there's only so many MVPs, um, you know. Uh, but, yeah, he's, he's – he's, I think he fits – he's the standard, I think, for what a first ballot Hall of Famer should be in terms of outside of the Kobe Bryants and Shaqs, who is just no question whatsoever. I think Pau Gasol is in that second tier of guys who are just like, yeah, he just came in here and – from the moment he came into the league, he was uh, either productive, important, all-star, winning, and outside of the league, he did excellent things as well, you know? Um, yeah. And P- Pau Gasol is probably fourth best international, oh, no, I, I should say European player ever, you know? Fourth, fourth best. So, it, okay, it's obviously. Third or fourth, I would say. Obviously, Nowitzki you're putting ahead of him. But yeah. I don't, I'm interested to know who are the other. Well, I think it's, I think it can be debatable after that, depending on who you're talking about. Um, but right now, I think fourth is at worst. You know, at worst, at worst, at worst, he's fourth. You could say second very easily. Yeah, um, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So I, I would agree, and I yeah. agree on the strength of the international uh, accomplishments more than anything, because I think that there's a way that you could look at what he's done. Um, in, in the NBA and say, yeah, he's a Hall of Famer, but I don't know if he's a first ballot Hall of Famer. I think you could kind of poke a hole in that. He's got six All-Star games. Uh, he did win two championships for sure, and he was obviously an integral part of those two NBA championships. He's four-time All-NBA guy, and he won the Rookie of the Year. But from a number standpoint, it's, it's good, but it's not fantastic. He also has played for quite a few teams at this point in his career, which is that was we're at four now. Uh, so you know, I don't, you could, I don't care how many teams you play for. Uh, the errors change in terms of player mobility. LeBron played true. for three teams. That's you know. true, but he's not LeBron. So we, or I mean, if you count Cleveland twice, I'm just saying it's, it's yeah. player mobility error. Guys move around. It's not how it used to be. I don't think that should be a part of the criteria. And I, 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 I wouldn't say a I, team every I wouldn't year. say it's a part of the criteria. I would just say that. It's something to consider, but I think he kind of supersedes that because of the the championships and then the you know um, like I said for me the the international excellence to me is what really just puts it over the top. Yeah, and I, because mm-hmm. yeah, I mean because the basketball Hall of Fame is the basketball Hall of Fame. It's not the NBA Hall of Fame, which is what makes it different than most of the the professional sports Hall of Fames out there. I, to me, that's what makes him, without a question, without a doubt, yeah. a first ballot guy. I think, I think essentially I agree. If, if there was no international stuff for Powell, maybe you, you could argue yeah. first ballot, second, you know, second, whatever. But with the international, I think yeah, it's, it's no question. Op- open and shut. So we agree on that. Yeah, it's no question. All right. So next, Tony Parker. First ballot. You're saying you're saying definitively first ballot. No, no, no. I'm I'm thinking uh, about. Okay. Ballot. I am going to say no, because if you compare him directly with Pau Gasol, mm-hmm. depending on who else is in that class, if mm-hmm. other people are at Pau's level or mm-hmm. above it, right? Again, mm-hmm. the Kobe's and so on and so forth, then Tony has to be left out because Tony has. Except for the fact that he has more championships, but he played with the best power forward ever. So, you know, um, it's the, the he was. I don't know if I, the 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 Spurs had other factors above Tony Parker as to why they won their championships. Mm-hmm. Even though he was important, he wasn't as important as Powell was because Powell in the Orlando championship, Powell defended Dwight Howard excellently. And his primary job was to defend the best player on the other team, which is not something that's going to show up in the stat sheet. But he figured out Dwight could only turn over one shoulder, him and Phil Jackson. And he stuck to that assignment and made Dwight worse as a result. And that's part of the reason they got those guys in five games. That's huge. And against Boston, he has to deal with Kevin Garnett. And that's, not, that's no easy task. And Boston, on paper, had more talent. But the greatness of Powell and Kobe 
it, you know, shifted the numbers in their favor. Uh, whereas with Tony, it's a slightly lesser version of that, both from the numbers, uh, both from the international accomplishments, even though he has more championships. So does he have less All-Stars? Uh, same amount of All-Stars. Same amount of All-Stars. So, yeah. Um, and Tony benefited from those All-Stars not being in this era because if Tony Parker played in the Curry-Westbrook era, he would have no All-Stars. So, whereas Powell would still probably make the All-Star team as a power forward in today's game. Um, hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know if I would say he'd have no All-Stars, but I definitely think he'd have fewer. But the one thing that is that, that, that Tony has that Gasol doesn't have, and if you do consider the fact that he played with the greatest power forward of all time, I think this is really significant for his Hall of Fame resume, is the fact that he won the NBA Finals MVP. That's great. And that's, that, that's, that's, know, a, I mean, that's, that's a big deal. That's a big that, deal because there are very few NBA Finals MVPs who are not Hall of Famers. You well, got, quick, you know. Yeah, I get that. But here's the thing. First of all, that's a voted award. And you know how I feel about voted awards. Second of all, what finals did he get that Hall of Fame MVP in? The 06 07 finals. And who is that against? <laughs> I mean, I don't know that that matters. No, but... that, was, that team was trash. Like, that, like <laughs> you could have gave that to. To the water boy, you know what I'm so, saying? I, no, no, you no, can, no, you can no, assign no, no. Sean Elliott to attend just because they know. beat a bad Cavs team, so that yes, means that's that. why. So it's like, I, I don't I don't look at that the same way I look. Well, here's the thing, right? When I look at Kobe Bryant's finals MVPs, that's different than Tony Parker's finals MVPs, you know. In yeah, fact, uh, a better right, comparison is right, all finals, in, oh, yeah, like, and Andre Iguodala, Cedric yeah, Maxwell, yeah, yeah, like yeah. that's. That's, I view Andre Iguodala as different because he got the MVP for guarding LeBron James. Tony Parker got the MVP. Who he beat up on? Larry Hughes, Eric Snow? I, I see. Okay. I understand and I agree that all NBA <laughs> Finals MVP awards are not created equal. I, 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 I completely agree with yeah. that, right? And I'm not saying this keeps him out the Hall of Fame, but first but of all, I'm, it depends but on what I, what I'm saying is Tony Parker is – Tony Parker was not a role player. You know, those no, guys no, were no, 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 no. those guys were role players. Uh, and I don't think Chauncey, Chauncey Billups wasn't a role player, you know. But no. if you're talking about Iguodala and Cedric Maxwell, those guys were role players. So they, you know, light, they call lightning in the bottle, essentially. Matchup, you know, or, or situation. Cedric Maxwell was looked at to just purely score the ball. Uh, I believe it was 1981 is when he won their finals MVP. And that was his that was his thing. He came in, he came, lit it up, right? Tony Parker was more than that, and I don't think I can – just because they played a bad team, I'm not going to just crap on his finals MVP award. I'm I mean, not it was the finals. It, it was the finals. We're, we're, no, we're comparing it to somebody else's resume. But, uh, and I'm saying but, but I, don't think it, I don't think it puts his resume up to Pau Gasol's resume. I think Pau but, Gasol's resume is greater than Tony's resume. But uh, like what I'm saying is Gasol, like the Lakers beat – the the, the Ma Orlando Magic – team wasn't a great finals team they weren't a great finals team but he they had were. he had one of the toughest assignments in that situation because Dwight Howard was a great player and he had to guard the toughest the toughest part of that team I, yeah I think Dwight Howard was a very, very well I don't know he made the finals and beat LeBron James that year so uh, in six games like yeah yeah, I mean <laughs> that that year he was a great player. If he yeah. was that player today, we'd be talking about him. Oh yeah, I mean I, I, that's why I stopped short. I didn't say he wasn't a great player, but I don't know. I, yeah. I just I think we got to be careful. So so with... you so so to clarify, you have Tony ahead of Pau Gasol? No, I didn't say that. That's okay. uh, what, uh, what, so, so what? you do agree with me? You just you just do you just kicking and screaming while you do it? Is that what? No, 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 no. Because that's because no, that's no. kind of what you always do. No, what I wanted to do was he, I he wanted gonna, to I, I wanted to clarify. Right? I agree. Yeah. No, <laughs> yeah, I, agree. I wanted to clarify that you weren't <laughs> properly giving Tony Parker as much. Are you all the props? I think as he's props Famer, no as question. he deserves. As he deserves. Yeah. Now that said, no, that said I don't right. think he is a first ballot Hall of Famer. <laughs> Y'all see how you no, do. I don't I'm, think he. Is. I'm glad we have such smart supporters on this channel. Well, we'll I just wanted. I just move. wanted. I think it's important to properly represent people people you know you got to see and sometimes you you can be real dismissive to to greatness you know you did it to damian maya now you're doing it to tony parker you know you just flick that elbow out at guys you know get out of here you know and you you can't do that to people you you know 
you just you dismiss greatness a lot and i i, I just report the facts brian no 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 you under report greatness is what <laughs> you do it's terrible all right next his teammate manu ginobili Manu is an interesting case because he? internationally mm -hmm. he's better than Tony. Mm -hmm. But in the NBA, mm -hmm. he is a notch behind Tony, except for the fact that I think Tony would have had a better case except for certain injuries that came in and reduced his performance at certain times. Mm -hmm. uh, Tony would be hands down above Manu if not for certain injuries that he got, like, mm -hmm. I, you know what I mean? I think there's a, a championship they might have won if it wasn't for Tony's uh, hamstring. So, yeah. And that would, ch that would make it a clearer case. So I think Manu is relatively equal to Tony, but I think the international thing, it depends on how much you weigh the international factor. Well, you, you definitely have to weigh it. You definitely have to weigh it. Um, yeah, it's just about how much. But the, again, same thing with Manu. Manu... Whether he's above Tony or not, he's below Pau Gasol. So I say he's not a first ballot Hall of Famer because, if, because for me, the Pau Gasol, like I said, Pau Gasol is actually the standard. I'm glad you brought him up first mm -hmm. because Pau Gasol has the all-stars. Mm -hmm. He has longevity. He has championships. And he has outside of NBA stuff. So whether that's your coaching career or your – college career or international he has that on the international level whereas with manu or as an nba player he is a notch below tony and probably two notches below pal so you know granted that these are small notches we're talking about perennial all-star these are peak peak not peak of notches yeah it's, 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 yeah yeah it's a peak of gram of all-star <laughs> below <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but I would I would say he's almost a dead even with Tony, uh, which is which is fair because their their uh, performances relied on each other, so they share some of this too. Um, they both benefited from playing with each other. Uh, so yeah, I put him in the same boat with Tony. Uh, if you put a guy of pow or better in the in the ballot, then then they're not first ballot. It depends on who else is on the ballot. Uh, I don't even hesitate as much as you. Uh, Manu Ginobili is a Hall of Famer, but no way in the world is he a first ballot Hall of Famer. Um, yeah. I would put Tony in first ballot before I put in Manu. And I do give him credit for his international play. And I do understand that he was a part of an ensemble cast, so to speak, with, um, with, with the Spurs. I do get that. But um, I can't completely ignore the numbers. And we're talking about a guy who never averaged 20 a game. Never averaged 20 games in, in his entire career. Uh, and I understand that he willingly accepted the six-man role, and that was what was best for the team. And it wasn't as if he wasn't good enough to start. But I'm looking at a guy who played an average of 25 minutes a night for his entire career. Like, he only played over 30 minutes a game for a season twice. So I look at that. And I look at the fact that your career at scoring average is 13 points a game, three and a half rebounds, 3.8 assists. That's, you know, I'm given I'm giving the Hall of Fame nod because of the team success and because of the international yeah, these success. Were, these were sacrifices that because we, yes. we know if Manu was on a different team. Oh, he's a 20 he point could, a game guy. Yeah. He, 22 points, five, six assists, like five so, rebounds. Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah, a yeah steal like, and a half. Yeah. 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 So Manu, uh, you know, and Manu played, he's, he, he was one of those shooting guards. He played in a very, very tough situation because his career was fighting Kobe Bryant as mm -hmm. rough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean that's his absolute contemporary in every way, shape. You yeah, know? yeah. So, so you know, props, and, and props. It, uh, he should get some credit. He looks like Bronson Pinchot too. So <laughs> you know, perfect. He's a perfect and he, stranger. And he knocked a bat out of the air with one swipe, which was crazy. Yeah, I think see, that goes on your Hall of Fame highlight reel. It has question. to. It has to. <laughs> but like yeah, Randy. not a first. We we agree. No, not a first. Not, not a first. Right. We have to find. I just, I just wanted to give him his due props. That's all. Same I thing I wanted to do with Tony Parker. 
I said Tony Parker is great and deserves to be Give him his back. props. Don't crap on his finals MVP award. I didn't crap on it. You took a squat on his <laughs> did, finals no MVP. Such you. thing, but we have a show to do. You who's, did. I'm trying to say this the, the on the show is when they heard, saw you do that. And it was just you know Tony Parker's people watch the show. Is he going to Chicago or something? What is happening right I'm now? He's, you know, you know, he has some Chicago ties because his brother went to Loyola. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, all right. Next, Chris Bosh. Oh, first ballot, no question. Hands down, he's got the numbers. Uh, it's like he's a billion All Star games. A billion. Uh, I'm, you know, obviously. He said, high, I, you know. High, hyperbole in the English language <laughs> to quickly and efficiently make the point that he has more all stars than everybody else we've discussed on the. He, on the does. he does. He uh, does. Yeah, he's no question. And uh, we, we've discussed on the show before, and I'm going to give my co host a little credit here. Oh, that is that. Cri- let, me yeah, take a, yeah. let me take a picture or something. I I, it, all the time, man. Uh, uh, <laughs> I mean, I had to do something. <laughs> Chris Bosch, uh, the people think that he took a quote unquote reduced role with the Miami Heat, but what he actually did showed more talent than what we were aware of because you could have made the case that in Toronto he was Boogie Cousins, right? Mm-hmm. A guy who's not, even though he had more success than Boogie, but a guy who's going to put up big, big numbers, but you don't really know if he's a winner. Mm-hmm. And in a situation where I heard this great quote about LeBron James uh, where they said he's like Galactus from the Marvel Universe where he's powerful, but he sucks the power out of everything around him in order to Mm -hmm. be powerful. Mm -hmm. And in that situation where LeBron needs things formed around him in this way, Bosch became a stellar defender, a stellar catch and shoot guy and when things weren't going right for lebron and james wade at the drop of a hat he'd go out and get your 30 and turn into old chris bosh so few players in nba history have that ability chris bosh is a hands down uh first ballot hall of famer and i actually i almost want to say i put him above uh pal gasol i uh, i i i do he is he is did, did chris win a gold medal um, did, did he ever win a gold medal? It feels know. like he did, but let's. I don't know uh, if he was a gold, gold medalist. I don't know. It feels like he did. Though. If he yeah, did, I, if he if he did, obviously that just. Yeah, then it's, yeah, no question. But it's, yeah, first ballot, first ballot. I think he's he's the. Uh, I mean, I think him and Powell, from a talent standpoint, are relatively close. But I would say I, I think he's, I think he's far more athletic. I mean, yeah, but Powell was also stronger and bigger, and I don't know. I, I think I think um, it's hard he, to say. He did win. He, he won a gold medal in '08 in, Be- in, in Beijing. In Beijing, right? There's no question. Uh, first ballot, open and shut case. Only there, there. I don't think there's anybody that would shove him out of, you know, getting a first ballot. But the only people that are above a guy like Chris Bosh are guys that are. MVP guys, your Kevin Durant and Kobe Bryant and Mike absolutely Trump, like that. But Chris Bosh is, you know, but because those guys are so few, yeah, you know, they don't take up all of the space in the first ballot Hall of Fame. Chris Bosh shares that space with those guys in the guaranteed open and shut. No way you don't put me in. Yeah, I would one hundred percent agree. Chris yeah. Bosh is is easily a first ballot Hall of Famer, and anybody who says he's not doesn't really know what they're talking about. I mean, he, I mean, dude, I mean, I mean, just five years in a row, averaging over 20 a game, you know, five, I mean, very few guys do that. And from the age 21 all the way to age 31, he was an all-star. He retired at, people don't realize, he retired at 31 years old and he had averaged 19 points a game, 19 and seven in his last season that he played, right? there's i mean and no serious injuries great none. locker room guy yeah well I mean, the only honestly, time he got re- only time he really was was the condition you know in in, oh, in yeah, four, at yeah, 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 yeah yeah at the end and in 14 and that 15. wasn't a exterior physical injury that was no. an interior heart blood yeah thing. he got hurt in 11 12 too though he only played 57 games that year 
Um, <laughs> Only 57. That's a, that's a good, that's a, that's, a, that's a Anthony Davis year right there. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, and he actually, the funny thing is, he always missed games, but he never, you yeah, know, it was a significant issue. It wasn't like, oh, God. Big guys miss games. But yeah, yeah, big guys going to miss games. So, but yeah, the, the, the guy, the guy's a beast. He was absolutely, I, I remember listening to an interview he had, and he was like, um, I, it was when LeBron had left. And the, the I, I was just I was taken by the the competitiveness. He said, "Man, you guys forgot, man. I can really play this game." Yeah, <laughs> and I yeah. was like, "Yeah." In, in fact, one Get thing him, I was Chris. saying that the shame about the Cleveland LeBron ending with the whole Chris Bosh thing, because what what had upset me about it was that they killed two Eastern Conference teams to create one which is mm-hmm. why LeBron went to the finals over and over because he didn't have to compete against Toronto and Miami, right? Yeah. But my thing was, if uh, Chris Bosh had simply gone to Cleveland, I thought LeBron would have won a championship there with Chris Bosh. And that's how good I think Chris Bosh is. Um, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, Chris Bosh, no question. Well, no question. Who else All is right. left on the list, Brian? Hey, 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 hey. This is what I'm talking about. I you know, just asked him, who's that, who's that I, I don't. I don't like it. I don't like the. I don't. This is harassment. Who do I? Can I file a grievance? I just, I just asked. Is there a podcast union? <laughs> you in HR? You need podcast. Uh, I gotta call somebody, man. <laughs> <sighs> All right, Derek Rose. No. Is that <laughs> what? Wait a minute. No, you didn't disrespect us like that. Why would you say something like that so fast? Why would you do that? To, well, I, uh, you, let, let, let's let's unpack what it. What is going on? Let's unpack it, Brian. Oh, uh, I'm about it. to get I'm a I, where's my back scratch? I need my back scratch. <laughs> I got to get my back. I can't reach my back scratch. This is what I do with like I start itching when people start disrespecting <laughs> me and us. I don't disrespect nobody. Do you think Derrick Rose's resume is better than Chris Bosh's resume? It doesn't have to be. You already said that, that there's room. There's room. There's room for other types of first ballot Hall of Famers. Look, okay, let's – okay, all right. So you're sitting up here, and you're going to sit here and tell me that you don't think Derrick Rose is a first ballot Hall of Famer. That's what you're going to sit here and tell me. 100%. What about the international stuff? <laughs> nah, B. He was he was he was the Illinois Mr. Basketball in two thousand seven. And he was all. also a McDonald's All American in two thousand seven. Mm-hmm. And he was a third team All American uh by the Associated Press in two thousand eight. And as much as he sat down, I'm sure he was a and, you know, and, and, diamond and, player in and, 2016. And and, and stop. And, <laughs> and 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 he won the rookie of the year in two thousand nine, and he was the NBA All First Team two thousand eleven, and he won the MVP in two thousand eleven, and he's a three time All Star. And here's the thing. Here's the thing. He's he's Grant. He, he's gonna wind up being Grant Hill, and that's there's no shame in Grant Hill. Grant Hill is a guy who was an awesome player when he was younger had tragic injury, missed a bunch of time, came back, became a good player, um, mostly for the Phoenix Suns. And, yeah, and, you know, because he was a good player on top of what he did, he saved his Hall of Fame resume, which is awesome because we all like Grant Hill, good dude. I think Derrick Rose fits it almost to a T, uh, same situation, when you equate for the different things in their career. But, but... He did win league MVP. Yeah, but Grant Hill had more outside of NBA success, didn't he? Did he win a championship at Duke? Yeah, oh, absolutely. So there you go. Absolutely. But but there, here's the thing. If he does not go into the Hall of Fame, and I know this is a conversation about the first ballot, but if he does not go into the Hall of Fame, you're aware that he would be the only person – in NBA history to win the MVP and not go into the Hall of Fame. You get that right. I, I, I didn't say he shouldn't be in the Hall of Fame. Like no, I was my just, thing with Derrick Rose. I'm just if Derrick Rose, if Derrick Rose um continues the way he's going, he's definitely gonna be in the Hall of Fame because the numbers will 
stack up on top of his healthy thing. And we know when guys make a comeback after really tragic injuries, and he could have packed it in. He had enough money to obviously just be like, forget this, you know. Um, but we, we like comeback stories, and he'll have the numbers to justify his healthy years when he was younger. Um, so, yeah, he, he should eventually get in there. And I hope he has the health to get in there. I hope he finds a better team than Minnesota to play on because I think he could help a championship level team. I agree. Uh, I agree. Like if he if he was in Toronto or something right now, that he could push them over the edge uh, with his play. Denver. So, it, uh, well, Denver has a lot of guards, so I wouldn't put him in. Just there. off the bench, though, I think that they they don't have. A, they have a hundred guards. Uh, yeah. I see, do they like, do they score like Derek though? Do they score like Derek? We we have to see how healthy Isaiah Thomas is because Isaiah Thomas there, Isaiah Thomas is forty seven inches tall. <laughs> that didn't stop him from averaging thirty. So <laughs> point just... point being though point being um, yeah Derek Derek can help a bunch of teams right now uh, and I hope he gets that opportunity to win a championship so that he can solidify his Hall of Fame resume and we're talking more about what he did on the court than how many times he was off the court and that time he ran home for no reason. Wait, what happened? Well, see, okay, we were respectful. We were going respectful. And then something happened. <laughs> Nothing happened. We, I, mean, like, I just report so, the facts. That's so, something that so, he did. So, so this is what was happening, right? We were respectful, right? And then all of a sudden it did that and we, and we fell off. <laughs> and this is respect. I'm and so then this respectful. is the conversation. And it just fell off and it Listen, wasn't respectful man. no more. Like, I'm never going that's to have what the delusional love for Derrick Rose. Well, that no, you but have. you didn't have no to can. say you didn't have to say he ran home for no reason. That's that's he the really did that. the meaning towards literally him. what he did. And I don't think that that was necessary. Is my point. Uh, so I want to give my take on his first ballot I Hall of bet you do. Fame. Them. <laughs> um. <laughs> I um okay. As of right now, no, he's not a first ballot Hall of Fame. No, he's not. If he is, if he wins a six man and an NBA championship, I think he would then be a first ballot Hall of Fame. But and I do think that both of those things are possible for him. I don't think it ridiculously they're ridiculous stretches of the imagination. Um. If somehow he was to have a great season, a great second half, uh, you know, continue to basically put up the numbers he's been doing, and somehow the the Timberwolves were to push their way into the playoffs, oh I think my he, goodness! I think I think he'd have, but this you know, I'm just, I'm just saying if they got on LeBron and get into, I mean, they're, not, they're only like three games out of the eighth spot, man. It's not like they're ten games back. They, I think they're like three games out of the eighth spot. I so if they were to get into the playoffs, then. I would say that, you know, he has a, a better chance of getting the six man at that point. He still has to contend with DeMontis Sabonis and Julius Randle, who some people may say are, are ahead of him. I and think Lou, Sabonis, Lou Williams. I think I think he's ahead of Lou, but I think Sabonis is definitely ahead of him. I think Randle's chances have fallen off because he started more because Anthony Davis has been hurt and they plummeted in the standings. <laughs> so I think that helps Derek a bit, but – yeah, I think he needs those two things to be a first ballot Hall of Famer. Outside of that, he's got to be like, I don't to be. Yeah, he's got to. What he ha he has over Grant is the MVP, but Grant has the college the college success. And, and Grant, didn't Grant play for longer before he Grant got was out? healthy longer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Than, than Derek. So, um, yeah. So that that's 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 the thing. So, um. Yeah, so you, you guys know Derek is my dog. You understand me, but I gotta be honest, he's not a first ballot Hall of Famer right now. He's not. All right, so that I was. I, that, I apologize to the people for what you that said. was fun until we took it down disrespect street <laughs> with Derek. I mean, because <laughs> totally uncalled for. I apologize to everybody <laughs> in Chicago who might be watching this, and we're seeing this absolutely rogue New Yorker just, <laughs> just. You know, wow. Anyway, let's move on. Let's talk about All-Star Weekend. Now, it's been almost a week now since All-Star Weekend. Um, 
and we got to start going. You know what? We got to start going live for some of these events. Yeah. One of us, or if not both of us, we got to represent at me, bro. After some of these events, UFCs and all this different kind of stuff. But anyway, what was your take? How overall? How did you feel about All Star Weekend? Uh, well, first of all, I'm glad that New York won the three point contest and the slam dunk contest. Shout outs to that. Um, wait a minute. Wait a wait a minute. Wait. Why does New York get to claim everything, even if it's not the? Because I'm, I'm sitting up here thinking, like, when did, who, did the Knicks win? Did the, what? And you, you're just gonna claim people from everywhere? How I'm gonna do Diallo because he's from New York? You are gonna claim that even though he plays in Oklahoma City? But if Dennis Smith would have won, you would have claimed that because he plays for the Knicks. Yes. Oh my God, this is sickening. If this Derek, is sick. hold on, hold on, hold on. If if Derek Rose wins Six Man of the Year, wouldn't you say I'm glad a Chicago kid won Six Man after that comeback story? No, I say I'm glad Derek Rose won the Six Man. That's and what I was. Would he be from Chicago? Wouldn't he be a Chicago kid? But no, he probably, he, probably, he probably put that award in the school in Chicago. He, no, he wouldn't. Uh, anyway, this is just disgusting. Just carry on because I'm Anyhow, disgusted. You know how many times I've been disgusted in this show? So, uh, <laughs> I thought, I thought, okay, so here's, here's the thing. I thought the all-star game was okay. I would say I like the peaks that we got from it. I, I mean, that, that alley-oop to Giannis. Sometimes what I, what I loved about this All Star Weekend was every event had a peak that I could sit back and really appreciate. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes people get too into wanting everything to be the best every time it happens. That's yes. just not realistically going to happen. No. So like, and this I'll go on a little mini rant here. Like the slam dunk contest. Every time we have a bad slam dunk contest, people want to change the format. Yes. These are athletes doing things at like Olympic level athleticism. It's not always going to be, you know, Usain Bolt. You're not going to always break race. a world record. It's just what it's it not, is. No, that's sports, right? Yeah. Sometimes you're like, oh, it wasn't good this year. The magic of it is when you get the Vince Carter, Zach Levine stuff. That having been said, even though the overall slam dunk contest was a bad contest, as a person who appreciates the peaks, Hamadou Diablo, Diallo jumping over Shaquille O'Neal was crazy. When he brought out Shaq, I thought there's no way he's jumping over Shaq. I thought maybe Shaq was going to throw him a lob or something. The, the, the fact that he, like, people talk about him, you know, vaulting. He just touched his back. Mm -hmm. That's just a human reaction. For as he didn't put his hand on top of Shaq's shoulder and change his trajectory at all, he just launched over the guy, and it that was an amazing. And he did the honey the honey dip, dip. yeah. After, that's crazy. Like he legit combined two or three crazy feats into one dunk, and that was one of the greatest dunks of all time. Mm. Um, and oh yeah, I think that's definitely one of the greatest dunks of all time. Like him mm. just. Clearing because he, if you look at it, he actually cleared Shaq by a bit and did the honey dip and did the Superman inside the OKC jersey afterwards with the music playing. And I don't think Shaq knew he had the Superman on, so the crowd was in on it. And Shaq didn't know, uh, he had a little swagger with it, so I thought that was awesome, even though the rest of the contest was trash. Um, Shout out to Kuzma in the rookie game. I don't tend to care about the you know, the all the rookie all stars thing, it sucks. The, yeah, that's because they, they play absolutely no defense in that game, and I just don't care about it. But the, the last one that I enjoyed was the one with Kobe and AI. That was sick. That was a good game because they, they, they was showing off against each other, and AI threw the ball off Steve Nash's forehead. Never forget. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you caught AI on the sideline and one of the things, they was like, he was saying, we can't let Kobe come out here and kill us. He got too many points right now. They yeah. was actually, they cared. Since then, I don't care about none of the game. But the three-point con three, three contest is the most consistent event because yes, it's, it like it's the home run derby of the NBA. It's, it just can't really be bad unless everybody's off and the shooters in the league are too good for that. Mm -hmm. And the fact that Steph was so good and he still lost, 
made it a really, really fun contest to watch. Um, All-Star game, honestly, outside of the Steph oop to Giannis, I didn't really care about the rest of the game, but that oop was crazy. Like, mm-hmm. the ball went so high, it went out of the camera frame to yeah. cover the game. And we always hear that line about Wilt Chamberlain putting a quarter on the backboard. But in game, we saw a 14-foot alley-oop. That is bananas. Um, yeah. Outside of that, the, it was an inconsistent All-Star weekend. But, you know, I enjoyed it. Truth be told, I watched more MMA than I did All-Star game for that reason. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I, I agree with you about the dunk contest on, on several uh, levels. I do think that people scramble. Uh, it, but I think you know what it is. It, it, it's just like the Super Bowl, right? Events like the dunk contest and the Super Bowl bring out casual fans. Yeah. Same way as a big fight, Mayweather and Pacquiao, whatever. Yeah. And whenever you get casual fans, you get a bunch of hot takes from people that don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. That's just the facts. That's what happens. So you got a bunch of people who barely pay attention to basketball or don't know much about it. They pretty much they're highlight people is what I call it. Mm-hmm. And if there's not, like you said, a bunch of dunks that are the greatest of all time, then oh, it's a bad contest. Now, what I do think was horrible about the contest was the judging. I mean, yeah, yeah. I think everybody was like, on some Dis- bird box. Well, they were on some bird about box. That 50, that was crazy. I thought they gave him that 50 because they knew if they didn't, that Diallo would phone it in. Uh, I don't even think they thought that much. I think they just had a bad group of judges. To yeah. me, I, I just, I, I, I mean, I don't even, I don't know what Candace Parker and uh, it was one other guy on, it was a guy on there. That I can't remember which one it was. But they I don't giving, want nobody judging that kid that never did a windmill dunk. How about that? I mean, you know what? I, I don't know if I'm gonna say that because, well, I guess he has too. Uh, I'm thinking about people who have who have given good takes before, um, and some of them haven't been great dunkers. But and, like you said, a guy like Kenny Smith, he was a good dunker when he was younger. Yeah, he was you know really good, really. And so was and, but Charles Barkley. Gives, Charles yeah. Barkley, I used to like his takes on some of the dunks. He, he was like, man, he was that a good dunker too. Yeah, he, he was, was a good dunk. He wasn't yeah, really. Was, a, he was a game dunker. He wasn't. Yeah, a contest I'm not. Dunker. I'm not yeah. saying I will only accept Michael Jordan, Dr. J, and Dominique Wilkins. I'm just saying, at least be a person who knows what it's like to perform a very difficult dunk. That's not. That's a fair criteria. Yeah, I think so. I think so. That's I mean, fair. it's just yeah. This judging was bad. The judging was bad. I felt. Um, so yeah, that was my problem there. I thought the three point shootout was fantastic. I, I really have no, yeah, yeah. I have no anything to say about that. You didn't mention the skills competition, which I think is really cool. I was about to mention that. Uh, yeah. I didn't get to it because we hopped on another point. And I, you know what? I'm gonna let you take it away. But let's just say Jason Tatum stealing that with a half court shot is one of the best moments in skills. That was awesome. That was and I do, awesome. I do like the skills competition. I need. I think they need to keep tweaking it. To yeah. make it a little more interesting of an obstacle course, make it yes, a little more difficult. I agree. I one hundred percent agree. One hundred percent. But I like maybe, the idea. I like maybe maybe about fifteen to twenty seconds longer. Yeah, I think would be and like maybe one other thing that you have to do, one other skill related thing you have to do. Uh, uh, you know what I would like? I'm gonna just throw this out there real quick. I would like it if when they went around the cones, if they had required dribbles. I would love to see one cone be behind the back, one but to be between the legs, one be crossover, one be spin. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, that would be pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. I would I would like that. Yeah, that that's something, something else. But also, you know, Spencer Dinwiddie had a really good point. He was like, um, veterans don't care, they don't go hard. You know? Mm-hmm. So I I'm sitting here and I'm looking at the way Mike Conley went through the thing. I'm like, dude, well, why are you here? Yeah. Like if you just gone through it, like why are you here? Right. You know, cause I've always made the, the, um, the comparison to me, the dunk contest is almost like the dunk contest is to an NBA star. What stand up comedy is to a comedian. Mm-hmm. It's like, they do it when they're coming up. <laughs> but mm-hmm. once they get to a point where they think they're this guy, then they don't do it anymore. Cause they feel like they've outgrown it. You know, there's some exceptions. There's some big time comedians that will still yeah, do stand up. I, 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 I honestly don't agree with that, but I understand what you mean. I mean, there's there's a, there's a lot it's of an entire there's, 
15 minutes of me beating you up about why that's wrong. No, no, there's a lot of stand you still you already heard about the Derrick Rose thing. So just no, gonna... I'm saying there's a lot of stand there's a lot of comedians who they they won't like Eddie Murphy said he wouldn't go back to stand up. Now he did decide later on, like 30 years later to do it, but he wouldn't do it. He wouldn't go back to stand. Well, I'll, I'll just tell you this because uh, um, I'm a little bit closer to the entertainment industry because mm -hmm. of my, you know, because my work. S comedians look at stand up as the ultimate display of chops. It is the bravest, most difficult thing you can do. And that's mm -hmm. the difference with the stand. It's, it, that's why when some guys say they don't want to do it anymore, they don't want to have to do it anymore. It, first of all, we weren't we weren't in the Netflix era where mm -hmm. people get right. big old paychecks. That's for, true. Right? That's it true. was less money before. It wasn't the stand-up comedy itself. But I think you're right about the dunk contest part of it. And since we're a sports show, your point stands. It is something <laughs> that you do early on, you know, that you don't do late. It's almost like, and this is a, a colorful example, but it's like when actresses, when they're younger, and then all the movies where their clothes keep coming off, <laughs> and then once they start making money, they in a pantsuit. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, I, we, ain't, we ain't doing that no more. I ain't in your teen movie where you spray me with the whipped cream. <laughs> That's over. <laughs> you know what I mean? A little more like that. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think I definitely <laughs> see what you're saying in terms of in terms of like how the Netflix era has changed it. But I, I do remember hearing multiple comedians talk about not doing that anymore uh, because they didn't have to. So I, that was kind of what I meant. Like, yeah, but it, that's it just, yeah, and it's more because of the touring and the, the yeah. money was bad. Yeah, like I, just different, yeah. but still, you know, still I think somewhat similar overall. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I thought I thought like I I don't like the rookie game. To be totally honest, I don't like the actual All Star game. I, I haven't for a long. The last actual All Star game that I that I liked was the one with um, w when Magic came back. Oh man, I really, really, really like the one where Michael, the, not the last one Michael Jordan did. I think it was the second to last one Michael did. Oh, I love that All Star game. Is that the one where Vince Carter gave up his spot? I don't no, no. I think maybe I'm thinking third to last. It's the one, I don't remember which one it was, but he blocked. It was this awesome moment where uh, Shaq got blocked and Michael caught it from going out of bounds and. It assisted it back to Shaq, and he was like, "Right back at you, big fella." It was crazy. Like, yeah, I think I remember that. Was that? Yeah, I feel like that was in San Antonio. I think in that one, it might have been like Sean Marion and Kevin Garnett and Kobe Bryant. Um, so yeah, I enjoyed. I enjoyed the AI one too when he got when they had that big comeback because they were a smaller team. It was him and Marbury. That was a sick game. It's it. The All Star Game has become a little bit like the slam dunk contest. It's like when the talent is together and they're feeling competitive, we're going to get a good show. This one, I thought, I think the three-point aspect of it has taken over the All-Star game too much, and it's too much of letting guys shoot threes. Because I, I think from a format standpoint, it's really fun to see teammates go against each other, like Steph getting a four-pointer on Clay and yeah, that was tra cool. trashing him for 30 seconds later with a yeah. bra branching taunt animation. Yeah. That was I love seeing that kind of thing. And one thing I really want to see in this format, which I'm actually a little sad about the trade, I want to see Westbrook, Harden, and Durant on the floor for an extended period of time at the same time while they're all still in their primes. Uh, it's the only way we're going to see that. So that will be really cool. But, yeah, it's, it's just about if the guys compete. If the guys compete, then it's really fun to watch. But when everybody's just letting everybody shoot and dunk, then it's whatever. Yeah, it's a dunk contest. So yeah, well, that was uh, yeah. I appreciated it. I, I I appreciated it for what it was. Um, so staying on the All Star tip, but going a little bit back on the historic side, and we talked about the dunk contest. We both talked about some criticisms that we had for the dunk contest, um, and wanting certain guys to be participating in it. Um, who do you th like? If you had to put together your all time slam dunk contest, and you had to put four guys out there on the floor who you felt were, were put on the best show and it would be the best competition, what four guys would you have? Vince Carter, Zach Levine, Sean Kemp, and Michael Jordan. I, so, and I, I, I'll give you a little explanation. Mm -hmm. uh, so Vince Carter is the greatest dunker of all time. There's no comparison. 
in a contest. Uh, in, the, in in a contest. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, maybe he, overall period. Just overall probably. Period. Just overall probably. Yeah. Overall probably. Yeah. Maybe. And I would. I, I don't the have a reason with that. Vince is the best is because Vince has the total package. What people don't realize about dunking is they think dunks have to be acrobatic all the time. It's not about acrobatics because there's a combination of grace, athleticism, and difficulty, right? And sometimes you can have enough of one that the other two aren't as important. Vince Carter has probably never in his life done an ugly dunk. Just the shoulder twist, the leg kick, the way he looks at the rim, the facial expression, how high he gets. that You can do the same dunk as Vince Carter and do it worse. You can get the same height as Vince Carter, and it just doesn't look as good. And so Vince Carter is the one guy who I think can do any dunk and make it look good. Michael Jordan obviously has the athleticism. He's as athletic as anybody who's ever done it. But he has the unfortunate uh, disadvantage of being earlier in life. So things that people thought, there was a, people don't realize, people thought it was impossible to put the ball between your legs and dunk it. And then after you did that, people thought that was the pinnacle of dunking. Then you got guys putting it under their legs and behind the back and throwing it off the side of the backboard and going behind the back. Like dunking has advanced since back in the day. But Michael Jordan had the, the most grace, I think, of any dunker overall. The most, like, you can just do an ordinary dunk, and it just looks amazing. Yeah, right? definitely. Nobody looks, nobody looks like Mike in the air. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But the, and to address what you were talking about with the throw it under your leg, that was actually being done before Mike. Orlando yeah. Woolridge did that in a dunk yeah, contest. Yeah. The same but dunk. It, it, but even even with that though, some guys are like adding three sixties to that. Like yeah. they're at, they're doing they're yeah. adding alley oops to it. Like you see, but my, my yeah. general point stands, right? Like we're seeing stuff we we didn't see. You know, I think Kobe Bryant was the last point where that was the last of the old school dunking, where between the legs was the best thing you could do. From Kobe Bryant back, it's like basically all the same dunks and then after that you started to see more and more and more experimentation um sean kemp is my favorite power dunker of all time i there's no person in nba history that i want to see just cock the ball behind their head and dunk it with two hands and make a face than sean kemp and i think every slam dunk contest needs a great great power dunker um and, and sean kemp also had the attitude to uh to bring it and i think zach levine is just in terms of the new school dunkers, he is just the biggest. Well, in his peak, he's like the biggest freak of nature, new school dunker that can do all of the new dunks, look good doing it. He's not that tall, and smaller guys tend to look a little better when they're doing that stuff. So that's my list. Yeah, I, I can dig it. Uh, I don't have much of a variation on my four, but I, as much as I love Sean Kemp, I love Sean Kemp. Sean Kemp is one of my favorite players period like if if i was to list my favorite like 10 favorite players of all time not saying my the 10 best but my 10 favorite sean kemp is absolutely on my 10 favorite you know my my, my list of the 10 favorites but i would have to i would keep vince of course i would keep mike and i would keep zach levine but i would replace sean kemp with aaron gordon okay and i and i understand that we're talking about the one contest. But I believe that Aaron Gordon's performance was the greatest performance in slam dunk contest history. Mm -hmm. I believe he deserved to beat Zach Levine as great as Zach was. But I think his, con his performance was actually better. I think the dunks he did were better. They were a higher level of difficulty. He did things we literally had never seen done before. You know, never. And I think that it's a shame that he didn't get a championship for that performance. Um, and I, I would definitely have to have, have him in it. I mean, that throw the ball under your butt dunk. I, I mean, I just like, no, bro, no. And then catching it from a spinning clown, 
yeah. on a oh my god i mean like the stuff the dude did was just from another planet and as great as sean kemp uh, was as a dunker I, I still consider sean kemp much more of a game dunker than a contest yeah. dunker like in a game sean was oh my god like he was repulsive with you know what i mean it was just it just like t- one of the best attitude dunkers just yes ever. and yes. and that's what it is it's like I love that. Now, I think Aaron Gordon is a fine choice. I don't disagree with your list at all. Uh, if it was top five list, I would have Aaron Gordon on there. It was more of a thing of – you use the word favorite a lot of times with Sean Kemp. Yeah. In my heart, I just couldn't leave Sean Kemp off the list because there's a certain joy you get from watching people dunk. And from a joy standpoint, Sean Kemp is in my top four. From a critical standpoint, then Aaron Gordon would be in my top four. The other three don't change. Yeah, yeah. Other three are, are pretty solid, not just however you look at it. It's pretty solid. Okay, so let's talk about current basketball again. And I, I got a question, and this is a probably, I would say, one of the most compelling questions right now uh, in the NBA. And it's, it's pretty simple. Will the Lakers make the playoffs? It's a tough issue, and here's why. Mm-hmm. Sacramento has a brutal four-game stretch coming up. So mm-hmm. the Lakers could pull even with them over the next few weeks. But Lonzo Ball, who for many good reasons uh, has been criticized as a player, he makes the Lakers a good defensive team. The combination of him and other players, of course. But Lonzo at that point guard position is a good defender. And that allows the Lakers not to have the greatest offense in the world because they struggle with the shoot. So unless the Lakers pick up some, some, you know, acquisitions from the waiver free, you know, market uh, guys that are just hanging out there, they don't have the shooting to not have good defense. Right. Look, now, the other factor is LeBron is usually a much, much better player after All-Star break in this latter part of his, in his post-31 career, right? Like, mm-hmm. after the age of 31, it's, he always has the worst January ever and then comes back and is, is really, really amazing. And I do think the Lakers are, and Luke Walton, are being criticized for injuries more so than how they look when they're healthy, which is they were fourth place when they were healthy, I think that was a product of other teams not getting off to good starts. But I think they were a sixth or seventh place team uh, if they're healthy. So it's, if everything goes right for the Lakers, if Lonzo comes back, if, if Sacramento struggles, because Clippers aren't trying to be in the playoffs, right? They're, they're kind of trying to lose mm-hmm. at this point. They're not doing a good job of it because they're well coached and they still have a lot of good players. And they so play they hard. Yeah, so they might they might still be a factor. Um, so L.A. has to go on a really good run, and Sacramento has to lose all of the important games so they can make it in. Do I think – here's here's a question I'll throw back at you. Should they make the playoffs? Should they make the playoffs? Um, like, do, I, would that I, be here, best? Here's, here's the thing. If, if LeBron was not on that team, that's not even a question, right? Everybody would automatically say, absolutely not. They should be tanking. They should be trying to get his best draft, his best, the best draft pick they can get, right? But because LeBron's on the team, and there's two reasons, really, well, and they're both because he's on the team, but there's, there's two layers to that. The first part of it is when LeBron's on the team, there's something in that clicks in people's minds that because he's been to so many finals in a row, that at the very least he can get them there. Like literally, that's what people think. And then, you know, you got a guy like Kuzma, who's a talented player. Uh, at playoff, Rondo is a different guy. And Brandon Ingram's a talented guy. And, and, you know, there's this thought that maybe it comes together, right? And it's LeBron. So that's the one thing. The other thing of it is, is people are so used to seeing LeBron in the postseason, doing what he's doing. And, and it almost feels like, if a great player like LeBron misses the postseason, whoa, what does that mean? You know what I mean? And so it's kind of like a 
it's kind of like a pride thing almost as much as anything that almost like he he's supposed to be in the postseason even if that isn't what's actually best for the Lakers the thing of it is is at this point where they are they might they may as well make the playoffs because they couldn't tank to a point right now from where they are to get so close to to the point where they would get a draft pick that would actually matter I don't think I would disagree with that in the sense that they draft well late and jo- there you could almost argue that Josh Hart and Kyle Kuzma going forward are the ones you would prefer to keep and those guys are later draft picks so well that's that actually kind of more supports my point because what I'm saying is if you're tanking you're trying to get a higher pick well I don't think I don't think the tanking is the word it's not about tanking what I mean about should they make the playoffs is this LeBron James hasn't had a long summer in a very, very long time. Mm-hmm. He just had his first significant injury. If he gets a legitimate vacation, he will very likely have a longer, more optimal later career. It will take valuable months or seasons away from him for him to play into the postseason this year because he's recovering from an injury. And you know he's going to go really hard in the playoffs. If he misses that, ice is, he has time to ice up, rest, relax, eat some cheeseburgers, then get back into shape, start cutting, you know, get in the training camp. They make their free agent acquisitions and come back strong for next season with a totally transformed team and all that other stuff. He has less time to do that if they make the playoffs. So the only, for me, the only benefit of making the playoffs is this. If one of the question mark talents on the team, and we're mostly talking about Lonzo Ball and Brandon Ingram. If either Lonzo Ball or Brandon Ingram has a good playoff run, they will raise their value in the offseason. Um, either because they might be somebody you want to keep or because they'll be somebody that you can get more for. Outside of that, they're virtually guaranteed to lose in the first round of the playoffs virtually guaranteed. So I don't know if that would be the best for the team. Well, I, I mean, I, I see what you're saying, and I, I, don't, I can't say that I find fault in that. Um, this is not a championship team. So that's the bottom line, right? It's not a serious championship contending squad. And because that's the case, whenever that, to me, for me, whenever I know that about a team, I always feel like it's better that they don't make the playoffs, right? Um, There is something to be said for when you have a young core and they have to go through that postseason experience because you don't want them to hit their prime and this is the first time that they've been in the postseason. But I don't think they're trying to keep those guys. That's the key. Right. So what's the point of building on a core that is probably not going to be there? Which is my other issue or other situation with this whole thing is – I don't know whether or not things have been damaged to the point with the young guys that they're kind of like, you know, you all, you tried to trade us all, you know, well, I don't, I don't want to group them together because Kyle Kuzma is balling. He, no. Um, well, but what I'm saying, not how much, how much do we have to go on as an entire team? since the end of the All-Star break. We don't have a ton of time to say this is what this person is doing and this is what that person is doing. I would hope... And, and ball is hurt, so... Well, I would hope that they're going to be professional and play play out the string the right way. Uh, but I'm just saying, you know, this is there. We're, we're talking about human beings. We're talking about people who, you know, guys who have pride and egos. And if they, you know, you see, I mean... You see how guys act when they feel that they aren't wanted. You know, it, it could happen. And so that's just a question that I have. Not saying that it will happen. It's just a question. Um, you know, guys like Brandon Ingram, Kyle Kuzma, when ball comes back. I, I think Lonzo's a baller. I think Lonzo's going to play how Lonzo's going to play regardless. I think that's just going to happen. So it's not really more about my, my, my question or whatever is and more about him. I guess if I was to single out a specific guy, it would be Brandon Ingram. You know, Ingram would be the guy who I would say, yeah, I'm wondering how do you feel, you know, based off of what's transpired, you know. Here's the, here's the, Brandon, here's the Brandon Ingram issue. Brandon Ingram 
is simultaneously better and worse than people think he is, right? He's a better guy with the ball in his hands than some people think he is, and he's not as good of a shooter as other people thought he was. He's a better defender than some people give him credit for. Um, so he's a guy who needs to go to a team like, say, Washington and have the ball in his hands. Like, I mean, and considering that John Wall, we don't know when he's going to play again, right? Um, he needs to go to a team like that or a team like Denver where – you know, he can be part of a system when they need him to play make. He can get into that Lamar Odom role. He's a Lamar Odom kind of guy. And LeBron and Lonzo and Rondo don't leave room for that kind of a guy. Because, I mean, LeBron's a better shooter than he was before. But they all need the ball in their hands. And LeBron in particular is basically worthless off the ball right now in his career. He's he doesn't do a lot off the ball for several. Uh, I don't. I don't. I, I don't. I don't. I don't. I'm not sure why. You, I don't. Not sure why you say that. Here's but. why. Here's here's why. Because the way LeBron's body language is off the ball, there are times when he's off the ball, and you can see his defender go. I know you don't care right now. I know you're just waiting for the ball, and they'll play him accordingly. And what that does is it makes it harder for the ball handler to do what they do. It's the opposite effect of what I was talking about, Russell West, Russell Westbrook. Paul George gets a lot of room a lot of times because Russell Westbrook will backdoor you and go into the paint if you stop paying attention to him. And he'll do that consistently. And what happens is that guy gets yelled at when he goes to the bench. And then Paul George gets to post up Joe Ingles four times in a row as a result. That's not happening for Brandon Ingram on the Lakers squad because of the combined effect of Lonzo's shooting. Rondo just being a pure point guard in his age, even though he's a better shooter than he's been in the past by far. And LeBron's off-ball consistency. That's why. I'm not saying he can't be better off the ball. And, and if it's the playoffs, he probably will be. And, and that's what I'm – and that is, is actually the point that I'm about to make. Because yeah, but, but I, I feel like – But we're getting to the playoffs, and it's an uncomfortable situation for Brandon Ingram to be in. Yeah, well, uh, well I, I, what I, at that point of the conversation, we weren't necessarily talking about that part. We were talking, you were talking about Brandon Ingram and why it hit, you know, he's simultaneously a worse and best player, uh, a worse and, and better player than what people think he is. And you said specifically that LeBron is basically worthless off the ball. And I think that that when is, Ingram has the ball in his hands, I think, I think that's, I think that's a, I think that's a product of a few things. And I think what most importantly or most prominently, I think it's a product of his the regular season. And that may not be indicative of the way he'll play in the postseason. Also, I think it's pretty indicative of, of the fact that from an offensive schematic standpoint, I don't think that anybody hardly is doing what's best for them in, in that offense. I, I find a ton of fault in the way that offense flows. So I, I don't know. I think LeBron has always been a good player off the ball. If there's a ball handler on the floor, he's always been a good cut a good a good cutter. He's always been a guy who played the screen uh, the screener well. Uh, so I, I don't, I, I don't, I, I don't. I I'm think that I'm talking about what he's doing right now this year in the context of Brandon Ingram's game. Brandon Ingram is clearly a better player when LeBron's not around. Uh, he showed he I, I forgot what he averaged last year, but it was something really good. It was like twenty points and several assists when he was running. They had him playing point guard. It was like yeah. a, a real thing, and it was consistent. It happened yeah. for a long period yeah. of time. And this year, when LeBron was hurt, there was points where it was like, "Oh, Brandon Ingram isn't trash." And then LeBron well, see, comes I back, guess, I, I and guess he has these thing. really bad performances. Uh, I just don't think he's a great player to pair with LeBron James, particularly when the other teammates are Rondo and Lonzo and JaVale McGee and Tyson Chandler and Lance Stevenson. That's just a bad group for him to be in. I agree. And yeah, so, so with, with Brandon Ingram, when you talk about them making the playoffs, they – I almost think they should have just traded him. Uh, but I know they want to get Anthony Davis in the summer, and he would possibly be part of that package. But them making the playoffs with this situation, I just don't know how good it is for them or anybody. Yeah, I, I think uh, I, th I agree that it's not a good fit. I just, I guess I took umbrage with the statement that LeBron's worthless off the ball. 
Right now, when when Brandon Ingram has the ball, it's it's a net negative. Yeah, I, I don't think they play well together. So yeah, but yeah, I, I don't think it's about that. I just think they it's just a mismatch. It's a it's a bad match of talent. But I also don't think that the Lakers have the team that they thought they would have this year. I think they thought when they got LeBron that they would have different guys, a different supporting cast, and they're just kind of going with what they have right now. I don't think I don't think they thought that Brandon Ingram would still be there. I don't. I don't think they thought that. I think they thought that at some point, either a trade deadline or in the, you know, in the offseason, after they got Paul George, that they would do something else that would have moved him at this point. But that's obviously not what happened. So uh, let's transition from the real uh, court to the virtual court. And this is a this is like I didn't actually do. We didn't do like generally we do a rant. And I'll be totally honest, I kind of forgot to throw that in there, but I was, I was going, wondering. I was wondering what happened with the rant. I was like, wait a rant. I, I, I did. I started putting together stuff and talking about topics, and I was like, whoa. And if I had had a rant, though, this would have been it. Uh, I got to ask people, and I want you guys to comment in the comment section. What do you think about this? And I'm knowing it's going to be ra just rabbit. And some of the people are going to feel a certain way, but they are probably not going to share how they feel because they feel like they're going to get all kinds of backlash from it. But what is your opinion about playing off-ball defense in NBA 2K? Now, obviously, we're talking about more. We're talking about head-to-head. -head. We're not talking about pro-am style. Because clearly you can't play off. I mean, you can play off ball defense, but it's called a double team. What's called just not defending at all. So, you know that that's that's pretty much what that is. So, um, if you're playing head to head, what is your opinion of off ball defense? I have no problem whatsoever with off ball defense. None whatsoever, because it's a competition, and. I think the computer is very, very beatable on ball defense uh, in the post and off the dribble and on pick and rolls. Uh, I think the optimal way to play is to switch according to the main threat that the offense is trying to provide. And the key is if you leave the computer to do 100% of the off ball defense, what you're doing is you're guarding the ball handler who's not the threat and the computer is guarding the main threat, who is the guy who's trying to get open. And if you need to be able to move to the off-ball situation to shut down people coming off of screens, uh, making cuts, and so on, and you know, running through the offense, and so on and so forth. And with our boy Dazar's offenses in the game, there's a lot of obstacle course runs that the offense will make. You've got elevator plays, a whole deal, that if you don't shut it down off the ball, they're going to get a wide open shot or a layup. And the CPU defense is not adequate enough to shut down those threats on its own. This isn't a one-on-one -on -one basketball game where you're guarding the guy and he's trying to cross you over and go to the basket. That's only true for certain teams. Maybe if you're playing against somebody who's using Milwaukee and it's five out and you don't want to guard Giannis, so you, know, you leave AI Kawhi on Giannis while you hide in the corner with Brooke Lopez, that's a particular situation where it's different. But in most cases, uh, it's not about off ball versus on ball. It's about guarding the point, the head of the spear on offense, which generally isn't the ball handler at the beginning of the play. It's a pick and roll or off ball action that's going to be creating the offense. That's my opinion. Yep, uh, I would almost 100%. I agree in every situation for the most part. Um, it's it's a strategy, man. It, it's a strategy. It's like I, I, I hear people say, I don't want to play against off ball. It's like I might as well be playing against the computer. You know what? I put it like this. Nobody would say that if they didn't have a problem with off ball, playing with, with people who play that. Because if you torched everybody who played off ball, you would never complain about it. You'd love to see it coming. You'd be like, oh, he's, I got him. You know, because the really, really good players that I've played against, if you try to play 100% off-ball defense on them, they're going to kill you. Yeah, just they kill the computer. The computer one-on-one -on -one 
has very BS defense, all right? The computer overplays on defense in a lot of situations. And what you have to do is you have to play into their overplaying. But the computer, wa- the computer wants to be Bruce Bowen. Mm-hmm. Like, no matter what the situation is. They yes. want to be up on you, guard you at half court, stop you from doing anything. The problem with that is, is that the computer jumps situations. And all you need to do is to get the computer to do what it wants to do too much. And then you're free to do whatever you want to do. And in yes. this year, it's easier than ever because as soon as someone's behind you, it's not a contest anymore. So, Which you know, is ridiculous, but okay. Yeah, so, get, so get in front of the computer and score. Uh, it's that, it's that, and the computer can't guard the post at all. It's actually very, very bad at guarding the post. So just use a post-up player and learn how to do hop fades and spins, and you're fine, and drop steps. Yeah, I mean, I, I really I, – I feel it's, it's just – you know what bothers me? is when people come up with all these unwritten rules. Yeah. And, and like, I've literally played, and not for long, for this exact reason, played in my G- or my leagues, and people have tried to mandate that you play on-ball defense a certain percentage of the time. Yeah, I've seen That is the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life, dude. I'm like, so you're literally telling me that something is literally built into the game. It's not a cheat. It's not like I'm using a lag switch or, you know, every time you go up for a shot, I pause the game or something crazy like that to try to show, throw off your shot time and nothing, nothing like that I'm doing, right? You're saying that I can't use a strategy. That is the dumbest thing ever. And anybody who really plays effective defense where they utilize some piece of off-ball, they don't play 100% off-ball defense. What you do is you switch back and forth between on-ball and off-ball. And you do that to disturb rhythm because a human defender does play defense different than a computer defender. A computer defender is not going to reach as much as a human defender usually, usually. And so – you're able to, if I'm going, if I'm switching back and forth between on ball and off ball, then you may be in the middle of a dribble move that you're about to do that you could get away with against the computer. But as soon as I see you hit it, uh, enter into that sequence, I can switch on and swipe at the ball. And a lot of times you'll disrupt, you'll make them hesitate, or you might even get the steal. And it's just about going back and forth. And then when you switch on defense, when you are controlling somebody off ball, who are you controlling? Like, I generally try to control a rotation ahead, right? So if I'm anticipating that you're going to pass the ball to the wing next, I'm going to take control of that guy so I can play passing lanes so that I can cut a guy off. You know, it's, it's, a stra- it's all a strategy, man. It's all a strategy, and the game is all about adjustments. If you can make the proper adjustments to whatever strategy your opponent is using, that just makes you all the more better. And I just uh, – I just – I, it's it's ridiculous, man. And honestly, I don't see a lot of people criticizing off ball defense who really understand the game a lot. Yeah. See, here's the thing, and uh, you know, if you watch the show, you know I'm a fighting game guy, right? Mm-hmm. And the first thing you encounter as a fighting game player is quote unquote cheese. And in fighting games, it works really differently than 2K because fighting games is very, very, very serious competition. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you cry that someone's cheesing you, uh, traditionally, you just lose your turn. And people say, you're a scrub, and you can't win. And what will happen is, if you keep watching as the levels raise, yes. see, the cheese only worked against you because you didn't know how to stop it. Yes. And there's a player who's better than you that forced the person to change their tactics. Exactly. And then they go into this dance of changing tactics and changing tactics until when you watch players who are the absolute best, it actually starts to look a little bit more like players at a lower level because the other guy is always dangerous. So it becomes this dance of these micro decisions. Now at a low level, it's not micro decisions. It's the lack of knowing what decisions to make. But at the highest level, it's, oh, the reason he did that is because the other guy thought he was going to do this in the last three times, blah, blah, blah. And now he baited him into thinking he would do that and countered at the, at the right moment. This, if you guys want 2K to become a quote-unquote sim competitive game, 
you have to cooperate with the game and the competitive community. And you have to become competitive. And you're going to have to learn some things you don't like. You're going to have to experience some things you don't like. You cannot stubbornly refuse everything that you think is cheese. Some of it is stuff that people in the game need to fix on the 2K end. Some of it, I hate to break this to you, is your lack of skill. Yeah. No, it and, is. Yeah. And so until you reach the upper echelon of skill, you're not truly qualified to talk about what needs to be fixed in the game. Because there's two ways to, for the game to be fixed. They can make the perfect video game, which has never been done before. Or they can make a video game that allows you to have fair competition. But within that game that allows you to have fair competition, there's going to be levels to it. And at a lower level, something is going to look unfair because it's constantly repeatable. Because in real life, I can't dunk on you 75 times because I'm going to get tired. Eventually, somebody's going to guard the paint and blah, blah, blah. But in video game competition, if you play bad defense, I may shoot 100% from three. The, the game is not supposed to bail you out and say, well, in real life, you're not playing real life defense yet. So you're not forcing real life numbers out of the game. Yeah. You're not forcing real life percentages out of the game. The game has to have the possibility of complete unrealism. And if you don't get your skill up, you don't get to deny that possibility of lack of realism. The realism comes from the competitors being evenly skilled. Now, once you are evenly skilled competitors, you can say, yeah, this thing is an exploit that is unfixable in the game unless you guys make the game better. And they can react to that. They can't react to it if they can always say, why didn't you just do this? Why didn't you just do that? That's it. You've got to compromise and compete. And so I urge you, welcome the cheese, welcome the exploits, win at all costs, not because that's the right way to play, but so you can properly learn the game. Because a lot of times, cheese is counterable, and you can force someone to stop doing it. And if you make them stop doing it, you don't need the developers to take it out of the game, because you took it out of the game by forcing the opponent to lose or cheese oh, or lose or play better. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think the thing of it is, is that I, I just don't like, I don't see playing off ball defense as a cheapening of the game. I, I, I think that's the thing. Some people feel like that it, it's cheapening the game or it's cheapening the experience. And I, I just don't see that. I mean, if that's the case, why would you accept a CPU steal? Why would you accept a CPU block shot? You didn't actually, you weren't controlling the guy when he got that steal. You weren't controlling the guy when he got that block. You know, you weren't controlling the guy when he happened to save the ball from going out of bounds. So why is it an issue if you're not controlling the guy who's actually playing the on ball defense or what have you? Like, I, I don't care, man. Like some people are like, no, it's different if you just go and control the center and just, the whole time you just control the center and you let the, the CP do so what if that's what he does there's got to be a way to beat him to beat that now if like books is saying if if those all of those ways have been explored and it's like oh god nobody literally there's no way to defeat this right we're not talking about double dribble where if you go to the right there's more spots to hit threes than there are going left we're not talking about that we're literally talking about an even playing field where everybody has the same options available to them, okay? You're just choosing not to play this way, and I understand if that's not what you want to do, but you can't put another person down because they play a way that you're not willing to. You and, know? See, and the key is willing to, right? Because right. here's how it works in fighting games. This is literally how it works, and I'm saying this because it applies directly to 2K. Somebody does something to you, and you go, and throughout the match, you're like, I don't know how to stop this. Then you go into training mode either by yourself with a friend and you repeat that action and you explore every option. How do you stop this? Does this button work? No. Does that button work? No. Backdash. Jump. What works? What gets me out of this? And then you figure it out. And then you go online. Somebody tries it. You body them. And you don't have to deal with that tactic anymore. It is effectively out of the game for you. Yep. Right? You have to become your enemy to beat your enemy. You can't say, well... 
my enemy uses high kicks, and I think high kicks are dumb. So, You're right. <laughs> so I'm just going to keep getting kicked in the head, or every time somebody right. kicks me I'm, in the head, I'm, I'm, I'm going to kick quit. in my head, and I'm going to cry to the commission and go online and complain about it. You yep. sound, listen, I'm not friendly when it comes to the competition thing, because it's, it's really, like, it's unpleasant to lose. It's unpleasant to spend money in a tournament and go and get your butt beat over and over until you overcome somebody. That's a trial by fire, yeah. right? And so I'm, I'm, I'm going to take the, you know, politically correct hat off for a minute. Just stop. Y'all just sound like a bunch of scrubby bitches, man. <laughs> like, I'm just not trying to hear it. Yeah. You know, if you don't like it, then stop playing online. Yeah. Play, just play your friends. Yeah. But when you go online, you have to win at all costs. You got to win, when, man. When you become a great player who has gone through the cheese, you are better equipped to help 2K make a better game. If you're sitting behind the wall of cheese where all the scrubs are, they also have people that are on the other side that are highly competitive. They look at tactics that you're complaining about and saying, that's not a problem for me. Yeah. And so when they look at their high level competition, if it's not a problem at the highest level of competition, the problem is with you. It doesn't mean that the game can't be improved in that aspect. But in order for you to get there, you have to improve first. That's yes. a life lesson. The world changes with you. Yeah. I mean, I mean it's really like it, it really is because it's like you can't criticize a process until you've tried it. And, 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 and tried to work in and around it and found it to be, it's like, it's like your supervisor gives you a directive. And from the beginning, you listen to it and you're like, this sucks. I don't think it works. I think it's whatever, whatever. But you haven't even tried it yourself to find out whether or not it's effective or not. You just don't like the way it sounds or feels. And, and so you don't know if it's, if you don't know if it's, it, it, you can't devalue it because you you haven't explored whether or not there's something in the process like books is saying that makes it ineffective because here's the thing if you wanted people if you if you want people to stop off-balling because people off-ball to win the game but if they never win when they off-ball they'll stop and if they don't stop just enjoy the victory right see, and this, this is the thing i see this a lot too they go, yeah, I beat the guy, but he just kept on doing it. This is what it's like fighting a scrub, right? So the yeah. first kind of scrub is the person who never learns how to play the game. The next kind of scrub is the person who only learns one thing, and they're going to do that thing no matter what. We call those guys dummies, right? Literally. We say right. he's, he, he's playing dumb, right? And you'll look at him, and he might have an okay record because there are more scrubs Right. And there are dummies. Yeah. Right. So, so he'll have a, you know, 55, 60% record. Right. But you mow through that guy because you say, I know what you're doing. I'm mm -hmm. going to beat it. And you're not going to change because you have stopped learning as soon as you stop being a, a total scrub. You became just a dummy. Right. The next person above the dummy is the person who is in the early form of competitive play. The person who does change their tactics, but they just don't execute it at a high level. You have to move up this ladder. You know what I'm saying? And stop being a scrubby little bitch. I'm not interested <laughs> in what losers say. Like, if you have yeah. a losing record in any video game, I don't care about your opinion. I'm sorry if that hurts your feelings, but there are other people who've been through the trial by fire that have seen it from both sides that we can discuss it. I'm not saying you're wrong about the problems in the game. I'm just saying I can't trust losers. I can't trust scrubs. I can only trust people who have, put, who have taken it upon themselves to figure out what's necessary to be competitive. And if what's necessary to be competitive is bad for the game, let's have a conversation. But if, you, if all you do is lose and get your butt kicked by the most basic of exploit cheesy tactics, good luck. Yeah. Good, luck, good luck with what you're doing. I've given you the answer to change your situation. You, you now have what you need to change your station in life. Go on and do it. Otherwise, stop bothering us with this scrubby bullshit. Good luck. Yeah, it's, got, it's, it's just going to be real tough, man. It's, it's, it's going to be, I mean, it's like I heard Andre Ward say one day. He was like, because um, Carl Frotch was being, you know, he's fought Carl. He fought Carl Frotch. He beat Carl Frotch pretty easily. And Carl Frotch was like, I just don't like his style. His style, I, I have a problem with it. I, 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 he was like, I even didn't even like Muhammad Ali's style. I don't like a backwards-moving fighting style. 
And Andre Ward said, you know, it's very interesting. Um, people have a problem with the styles that they haven't figured out how to defeat yet. Yeah. And that's essentially what this is. You haven't figured out how to beat off-ball defense. So you don't like it because it beats you every time. You know, and it's, it was almost the same thing with five out, you know, in Pro-Am. You know, people, they weren't stopping it. You know, so and they were only you, the, you heard the most complaints about five out after somebody got torched. Now, here's here's the, I think five outs a great example. And I'm talking about pro-am also. Right. Five out became the complete and total meta at the highest competitive level. Mm -hmm. And so you could take that data and say, these are the best players in the game. They know all the dribble moves. Mm -hmm. They switch on defense. They communicate. They hit their shots. And they've all as a community, decided the meta, most effective tactics available, and that is five out. Now, 2K, here is what is preventing us from defending five out. It's on you to decide how to rebalance your game accordingly because as the com competitive community, it is hard data now. It's not opinion, right? Everybody who wins does five out. Everybody who, do who doesn't do five out loses. That's hard data. So now, if you complain about it, you can point to actual hard data and say this is a problem. And you can analyze why it's an issue. Now, it's worth saying that five out is effective in real life. So <laughs> yeah. it is what it is. The problem is if it's the only effective thing, why aren't other things effective? Because styles make fights. And if you only yeah. have one style of play, then the game yeah, needs to be It's dull, yeah. Is then you get the game needs to be rebalanced. So that the five out thing is actually an example of the community putting in the work with five out and with other styles to where 2K can actually look at that and rebalance their game. Not to take five out out of the game, because if the Milwaukee Bucks are doing it and they're number one in the league. You should be do it in 2K. Right. It's an unfortunate reality of the dimensions of the basketball court. Yeah. And if you yeah. just you just don't like it. I mean, like a lot of people didn't like Memphis grit, grit and grind because they right. felt it was boring style. But it hundred percent. Well, and they changed the rules. Yeah, they didn't like it either. Yeah, right? so they didn't like Detroit versus the Knicks. So they changed the rules. Yeah, it it is what it is, man. But that that's that's the way it has to go. But I just thought that was interesting because we had a, a kind of a big debate about it on Twitter, um, and I readily tell people. I I will play off ball defense. All, all, I mean, it really just depends on the matchups. You know, if I'm playing against a guy, you know, or somebody who is extremely skilled dribbling wise, and they have control of a player who is just who can do all of these different moves as well. And, and on top of the fact that they have the stick command that they have or dribbling, I am going to switch back and forth between off ball and on ball against that person to try to disturb that rhythm on every possession. That that's what I'm going to try to do. And I'm going to try to help off of the bet, the worst shooter on the floor. Of unless. Yeah. Cause that's basketball. And here's the thing. You don't have the tools in the game to intelligently tell your computer player, Hey, I want you to help and bait off of the worst shooter on their team. Right. They're not going to come up and fake, like they're guarding and then rush back to their man. They're not going to, you know, run up for a harsh double team, but rotate to the most obvious shooter. I got to do that. You have to do that. And that's the yeah. highest level of one-on-one -on -one 2K play is yeah. when you're rotating in a way that's creating mind games. But look, man, I know a lot of guys in Sim Nation have like some feelings about, you know, off-ball stuff. And unless you guys are at NYC to Futures level, not complaints. No offense. Like, I love you guys as, you know, people. But when it comes to the competitive aspect, I'm telling you right now, there's nothing in 2K that's worse than X Factor Level 3 Virgil and Marvel vs. Capcom 3. So I don't want to hear it. Y'all are not facing the worst cheese available in competitive games. Like, y'all really need to embrace this and get through it if you want your game to get better. I'm not saying the game is perfect. I'm not saying that you have all the tools to play a perfect sim game. I'm saying that if you want that, you have to budge. 
you have to get these religious ideas about what 2K is supposed to be out of your head and embrace the reality and start winning. Yeah, I mean, I, I and you know, I don't even think it's, I don't even think it's, uh, I don't even think it's the competitive guys. It's really not. It's that middle tier, right? It's that middle tier or lower tier, like you're saying, because the re- like the. the, I just, the I, when I say competitive, I just mean people who play online. Yeah, yeah, because it's definitely not the the elite players because the elite players don't complain no. because the elite can players the elite players mindset is 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 geared into the meta what is the meta how do i win how do i win how do i win and that's what they're interested in so i, I think it's definitely an interesting discussion it'll be interesting to see how what the what type of comments we get for this particular vi- uh video I'm, this I'm, segment i'm sure i'm sure they ain't gonna like uh since there's, there's some people that ain't gonna like this one you know, yeah, I believe my, it. You, I'm you know, gonna get some unfollows today. Yeah. But you know, l- listen. Here's the thing, though. I'm trying to give you what you want. I'm trying to give you the power to improve 2K as a game. Unfortunately, like many things in life, the the thing that you want is on the other side of a thorny bush of discomfort. You got to go through the haunted forest in order to get to the princess in the castle. That's just how it works. And the haunted forest in this case is everything that you consider cheese and exploits and uh, dishonorable tactics. We're not talking about stuff like pausing the game. Yeah, that's crap. Or Ethernet cable. We're talking about stuff inside the dimensions of the design of the game. Yes. If something inside the dimensions of the design of the game bothers you, learn it, adapt to it. And then from the perspective of a person who knows it inside and out, knows it from the perspective of someone who can do it, who can beat it, and who knew what it was like to not be able to beat it, knows what the game looks like at a high level when everybody knows how to deal with it, then say, here's what's causing that problem. Because often, it's actually a very technical thing in the game. 2K, let me tell you a secret about 2K. They're not filled with a whole bunch of competitive esports tournament guys. There's a few, but a lot of these guys are game designers who are specialists in various areas. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's something in some guy's area that's causing you a problem. And that might be a very specific, very technical thing. It's it's, uh, it's Steve, the rebound guy. Remember, see, Steve, the rebound guy. He's the worst. (laughs) Steve. Steve. So it's worse than Derek Rose's doctor. Oh, but (laughs) see, it it happened again. It happened again. It (laughs) happened again. Out of nowhere. It happened. <laughs> like, I don't know why that had to happen. See, this is what I'm talking about, man. <laughs> we don't think, have think, to do it. I think, I think we beat them up enough, though. Guys, Guys, seriously, I'm trying to help you guys out. This is not yeah. me saying you're wrong or you're liars or you're crazy or whatever. but It is kind of, but it's, it's okay. It's, it's, this is how you deal with it. You've got to become part of the hardcore competitive community so that you can properly be an asset. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I, I totally agree, man. It, it's, it's just ridiculous. The things that, like I said, the things that people try to, to put on us, man. It's just like it's, 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 it's just crazy. So, um, you, you were talking a lot about fighting games. So, there is one that is coming out actually on March first. I actually have. A, uh, a, I actually have a review copy of it that I've uh, actually gotten a chance to play a little bit. It's on the screen now. It is Dead or Alive 6 by Koei Tecmo. And, um, I mean, I've played Dead or Alive, the series, for years. Mm-hmm. Um, I must say it, it hasn't always been my favorite. Um, and, and my reasoning for it not being my, one of my favorites is really kind of interesting, right? The characters are too large on the screen for me. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And that is something that I it it feels feels like the guy the characters are somewhat hindered. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's my that's always been my issue, and that's kind of a it is what it is kind of a thing because this is just the style of the way the game is made. Mm-hmm. Um, but it it makes to me the characters are not as dynamic to me, and the movements aren't as exciting. But I think from a technical standpoint. It is a, a pretty solid. Um, I know Virtual Fighter used to get a lot of respect for uh, how technical it was as a fighting game, but because because you're more far more of a uh, fighting game guy than myself, and, and I love fighting games, but I know you you're more on that end. 
what has been your your thoughts of the Dead or Alive series and how are you feeling about DOA 6? Uh, well, DOA 6 is wait and see. My problem with Dead or Alive has always been two things. One, I'm much more of a 2D fighter than a 3D fighter. Um, and when it comes to the 3D fighting games, the one that I like the most is Soul Calibur. The mm -hmm. one that's probably the best is Tekken. The one that's the most like technical and hardcore is Ver Virtual Fighter. I don't think that Dead or Alive is a bad game, but it's very rock, paper, scissors. And my problem with the game has always been that there are not enough styles and variety in the characters. Uh, there's actually modders who put Dead or Alive models into Street Fighter V. And it was so interesting because the back of my brain was like, oh, well, this should make the Street Fighter characters more attractive because Dead or Alive focuses on making their characters more attractive. But what actually happened was they almost looked more like mannequins because they have so much less personality than the way Street Fighter designs its game. If you look at just the women in Street Fighter, you look at Laura and Cammy and Chun-Li and Jury and Mika, they all have such physically different bodies, but they all fight according to those bodies, right? Mm -hmm. The same way in real life MMA, you look at Yoel Romero and you look at Francis Ngannou and you look at Israel Adesanya, they fight the way they look and something clicks in your head that it's like, it makes sense. Because mm -hmm. as we said earlier, styles make fights. And when the evidence of that style is on your character in the way you move, it just kind of hits home. Dead or Alive has always focused so much on the aesthetics of their characters, but in a way that for me has been too separate from establishing a style of the characters. So I don't feel like the characters have enough different height, movement, speed, range, grappling differences that when I see a matchup, I'm really thinking of the styles make fights kind of thing, which is more present in a lot of the other games. Although generally a little less so in 3D games, which is probably why Virtua Fighter is the most hardcore, because that is a game where styles are very different. And in uh, Soul Calibur, the styles are very different. It's very different watching Sophidia versus Mitsurugi than it is watching Raphael versus Astaroth. It's like mm -hmm. a very different experience. Whereas with uh, Dead or Alive, it, just the animations are different, but the pace of the fight seems to be the same rock, paper, scissors kind of interaction. Although, in, whenever you discuss Dead or Alive, it's fair to talk about they've always had the burden of not being taken seriously because they promote, you know, a, se a sexuality in their uh -huh. game. And they do it fair. They do it with the men and the women, right? They're all made to be, like, attractive people for the most part. And, you know, they've got the jiggle physics and all this stuff. And they recently had a big controversy. I don't know if you heard about it. But at Evo Japan, uh -huh. um, they were supposed to advertise their game. And, you know, was, I guess people thought it would be a regular advertisement. And what it actually was was they had these two Japanese models, female models, and they were running through some of the stuff in the game and putting the characters in like exploitive positions. So they would have uh. a, guy, a guy power bomb a girl and they would pause the screen and like zoom around it and laugh and giggle about where his face was in that animation. And then the yeah. girls started pointing at each other's uh, various attributes. They started spanking one another and think they might've kissed each other. Wow. And they cut the stream because they said that it didn't reflect the, reflect the core values of Evo. And it was very interesting. But, but, you know, Japan and America are very different. This was Evo right. Japan. Mm -hmm. And the debate that came up out of it, first of all, the fighting game community totally trolled them with the core values hashtag, which you guys can look up and find some good comedy. But Mortal Kombat came out, and there's literally people ripping each other's faces off and dragging the what's left of the face on the ground <laughs> throwing what's left of that up into a helicopter and that's splitting up the parts into the, and no one says anything, but as soon as you show any aspect of sexuality, everybody, you know, uh, starts clutching their pearls. And it's an interesting dynamic in America that n literally no level of violence, as long as it's adult on adult, no level of violence bats an eye but a shirt that's cut too low or, you know, a skirt that's too short. And we're like, what about the kids? And I bring this up with Dead or Alive because it is true 
that people don't talk about it enough as an actual fighting game. They talk about it more in terms of how they feel like, well, I'm embarrassed to play it because it feels like, you know, I'm like I'm a 12 year old seeing his first, you know, whatever. And, yeah. uh, you know, and that's an element of it. And I don't have an opinion of it here or there. Um, I feel your artists aren't do what you do. If there's an audience that's willing to buy it, as long as nobody's getting hurt, have fun. Uh, but as a fighting game, Dead or Alive lags a little bit behind. But I'm always interested in it because uh, the first time I played Dead or Alive was on the Dreamcast. Ah, and, yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah, and it was right. I was actually playing a lot of Tekken at that time, and the fluidity of Dead or Alive blew me away. It was like the best looking game on Dreamcast at the time. Yes. And I remember the first time I saw a counter, I'd never seen characters interact like that. Even though Paul from uh, Tekken had counters and stuff, it didn't look the way it looked in Dead or Alive. But over the years, it still kind of feels like the Dreamcast version of the game to me. Yeah. And I'm not a high-level Dead or Alive player, so if you are, feel free to correct me in the comments. Hit me with an Ask Us Bro uh, with your opinion on it. Uh, I'm more than willing to get deeper into that game if it's a good game and it deserves it. But as of right now, if this was hot or cold, I'd be a, a chili, a chili warm. No. I'm going to look at it, probably not going to buy it. Yeah, I, I feel you. If there's, if there's a 3D game I'm going to play, it's definitely going to be Soul Calibur, which I like a lot this year. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I definitely see the scantily clad females in it. And I, I, I do feel like it's a little cheap. You know, like it's a little cheap, like you're trying to lean on that, so to speak, as a as a as a as a piece of appeal for your game. Like they absolutely want to be known for that, you know, because it, it, it apparently from a financial standpoint, it has worked for them. You know, uh, it, it, you know, it has helped to um, individualize their game. They clearly are the most sexual fighting game out <laughs> without without a question. Um but you know, I maintain. I still feel like the character is too big on the screen. Um, yeah. I I agree with what you're saying. The the kicks, everybody's low kick looks the same. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it almost feels like you can chain you chain together the, the the attacks, and they all feel like the same chained attacks. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like you're just swapping models more so than actual fighters. And that's my so, issue. I feel like, Brian, to capitalize on, on that point, if the game was more dynamic, I, w I don't care about the presentation of it, outside of the fact that the characters aren't different enough. You know? Uh, you said it's the most sexual. It's interesting you say that because they show the most skin, right? But the characters aren't, you know, in interacting in a sexual way. Like, well, one, I think that when I say that, it's like, the the women in the game, like put it like this, I'd forgotten yeah. that that was one of the things about Dead or Alive, right? I'd forgotten about it, so I didn't go into looking at it like, oh yeah, this is the sex fighting game. I didn't go into it. <laughs> I didn't go into it thinking that at all, right? right? So I turned it on, and like the you know one of the characters comes out, and she's got on like something that like cuts right up to the top of the hip. Yeah. And she had on she had on like you know the thigh highs with the designs on the top and the joint, and then she had like a low cut thing, and then when she moved just a little bit, it she gets the, up, she gets the up. breast jiggle. Start doing start doing some crossovers. Yeah, she starts doing she does the <laughs> breast jiggle. Like, I mean you know like anime don't get me. I mean I know there's some people's thing like they they did yeah, they get super hot off cartoon girls. I that's never been my thing, but. You know, I'm looking at it, and I'm like, she, she jiggles here or whatever. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's what the, this is the dead or alive thing. This is what they do. You know, so it, it definitely is like you don't have to actually put them in sexual situations to to be sexual. You know what I mean? Like, you know, well, it's I, just I, I just say I think that I think it's different than being sexual. You know, yeah, well, I don't know. You know well, then, then being overtly sexual. Yeah, uh, because oh, yeah. There, because there oh, yeah. are games that are like that. There oh, are yeah, games. yeah. But I, I guess I said, like, for, I, I was talking about from a fighting game standpoint. Yeah. I mean, now don't get me wrong. Like, Soul Calibur with Nina, Nina is like, she, she, could, she could fall right into Dead or Alive. Mm -hmm. Easy. You know what I'm saying? Because she, like, from an entire standpoint and all that stuff, she would fit right in. 
But um, yeah, I mean, I do. I definitely think it's 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 definitely more sexually natured than most of the than almost pretty much every fighting game. But yeah, and, and there's a lot of bo booties hanging out in Street Fighter too. Uh, for the man, again, for the man and the women. And yeah. in fact, uh, Tekken has underwear outfits, and that's why I say like. I get it on the one hand because that is their focus. On the other hand, other fighting games, you know, to, to, to some people, other fighting games are closer in that aspect than they're being maligned for. But Dead or Alive is the only game in the musical chairs where they're left standing up where people are like, too much breast. No. Well, I, think, I, think, I think the reason being is because, like you said, they make it a part of their marketing package. Yeah. Yeah, that's and true. I and I think that that's the difference, you know. It's like you, like I see Nina, and also Caliber. I'm like, oh, she don't hardly have no clothes on, you know what I mean? And I see it, but it's not like part of the marketing. Like mm -hmm. they're not gonna set up something like you just said they set up at Evo. So yeah. it just, I mean, I, I'm not like. And, and I, also, it's it's worth saying that in Japan, sex is funnier than it is in America. Oh yeah, like, I, I, yeah. It, it, the the cultures, the cultures the, the, are just totally different. We we take it very 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 seriously here. Like every button you unbutton in America is like a different rating, whereas in Japan, it's the, it's the human body is funny and sex is funny, and sometimes it's it's okay to laugh at that in a way that's no big deal to them. Yeah, and I mean, I, I, I'm not I, saying whether that I'm not saying whether that's right or wrong. I'm just saying that we take it more seriously than they do. I 100% I, I agree with that, and I, I've known that to be a fact for sure. Uh, but and, and I didn't necessarily mention that to say, oh, well, this is like this, you know, horrible drawback of the game or anything like that. I, I think it's a characteristic of the game. It's, it's no different than a movie that has sexual undertones to it yeah. or whatever. It's, it's pretty much the same thing. So if, 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 if that would be a turnoff for you in a film, it, this it should be probably a turnoff for you in the in the game as well because it's really the same thing, you know. It's really the same thing. So uh, I think sometimes because games are games and we automatically still in some ways associate gaming with children automatically. I think we have a different thing, but I do think it's just important to have have a rating on the game. I think that is important. So then that kind of tells you what you should expect. And so just so anybody knows, you see that M there, it's rated M for mature. So <laughs> they, they knew what to say. They, 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 they're telling you what's in the game. And they, so you have all of you, you're armed with the right information for you to make the decision you want to make about whether or not you want to buy the game or not. So it is what it is. So, but speaking of fighting, let's talk about some real fighting. And okay. so you, uh, the UFC has original has um, just uh, uh, somewhat announced it hasn't been one hundred percent confirmed, but it's coming shortly. That uh, Israel Adesanya, who you mentioned a little bit earlier, will be fighting Kelvin Gastelum for the interim middleweight title. Now this is happening because Robert Whitaker uh, had the unfortunate abdominal injury. There was a bowel problem. And he had to pull out of the main event against Gaslam at UFC 234 in Australia because of this injury. So he's not going to be ready to compete anytime soon. And it's because the UFC is, for whatever reason, all of a sudden now trying to make sure that somebody defends their title, uh, you know, regularly enough, which was not a problem with Conor McGregor held the title for hostage for like two years. But that's an entirely different show. Um, they're wanting to go the interim route, right? Uh, and they've done that. This is not the first time they've done it. They've done it before. So uh, it is what it is. So I wanted to ask you, what is your opinion on interim titles in the UFC? I love the interim titles because it sets up a path that I think is interesting. Because what happens is um, when the championship is vacated for one reason or another everybody's left it there's that old sport saying you can only fight who's in front of you you can only play who is who's in front of you right mm -hmm. and you have someone who's saying i beat everybody else here i am the best and now you got to get back up off your butt and prove to me that you deserve to be this and in different scenarios it'll be for different reasons so like in the case of a connor who didn't have a major injury or something, uh, you call him out and say, you've been running from me or something like that. That makes the fight interesting when the interim 
fights the guy who had it before. So a lot of times uh, UFC has been accused of not having a clear path to the title. Who's a contender? Who deserves a shot? And blah, blah, blah. Whereas I think the interim actually cleans that up in a situation where if you didn't have the interim, it could get really messy because you got people waiting around uh, for one person. And I think it puts pressure on people who aren't defending their belts to be active, uh, you know, to rehab, take that extra time off or whatever situation it is, because then interim just becomes the belt, you know you vacated it and now it's theirs and they've put in the work while you were away to prove that they were the best. So I'm totally fine with interims. Um, Here's the thing. As a, as a singular concept, I don't have a problem with interims. The execution of the interim championships in the UFC and, you know, the inconsistency of when they're brought out is where I have the issue. Um, Mm -hmm. Very, the the UFC absolutely needs to set a standard that says that our champions are required to defend their titles, blah, 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 amount of times, a year or or what have you. If for Mm -hmm. whatever reason, you cannot come to an agreement that says it. So say for instance, the rule is twice a year. If you're a champion, you should you have to defend your title twice a year at the least, right? So if that's what your if that's what the deal is, if for whatever reason you're not going to be able to you you're not you're you're you know like say for instance you fight in March, right? You pretty much expecting you to fight in September, and if not in September, then we need to see you fighting in October, November, whatever at the very latest December. But if it happens, if, if it comes up when here's your, here's your last card in December, right, and you have not defended your title as of yet in the last card in December, then an interim bout, a title, a, a bout for the interim, for your interim title or for an interim title in your division should be set at that point, you know, because you're, you are holding the belt up and no one knows exactly when they can expect for that title to be uh, available. Now, here's the thing. What I also think should happen is there should be a cutoff for how long an interim title remains in existence, right? So say, for instance, if you were supposed to have a bout in, uh, you defended your title first in March, right? And now here it is, September to December, you're supposed to defend it again, and and you can't. So in in December, we establish a interim t- a interim champion if you now have two more months after that in which to defend your title if you cannot then now that interim champion to me should then become the actual regular champion mm-hmm. you know what i'm saying and if a, 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 to me that needs to be a hard line hard line policy and setup and rule and structure right for the UFC so that you can create some consistency, not just for the fans, but for the fighters themselves, mm-hmm. you know? And I think that that's what we're not seeing. I think we're seeing a lot of preferential treatment. There's no way in the world Conor McGregor should have been allowed to gallivant around, not defending that title for two years. There's no I way agree. in the world that should have been able to happen. Especially we saw, I saw, we saw Frank Mir stripped of the title after he fell off a motorcycle. <laughs> And got injured, and he he had stripped of his title. You know, we've seen like uh, Nico Montano had a legitimate injury from cr- from trying to cut weight. She and she had battled injuries before. She gets stripped of her title like that. It, it, it's just the the inconsistency is ridiculous. So that's what I think puts a bad taste in the mouth. Uh, and, and then even with Tyron Woodley, Tyron Woodley was was they were they created an interim title, but ultimately ended up stripping. Kobe Covington of the interim title, but they created an interim title and Ty- and Tyron Woodley had never been so inactive to the point where that should have been that, you know, that that should have been the case. So it's really, to me, like I said, just about consistency. I don't have a problem with, um, with, with the, with the concept itself, but it just has to be consistent. Yeah. I'm a hundred percent with you. I mean, it's kind of two subjects here. It's the preferential treatment that we see that goes on 
-hmm. and then the concept and execution itself. I agree with you. I think the interim title should be the first phase of a warning shot to the yes. current champion. Stripping a, that you stripping need a fighter. To, yeah, yeah stri stripping's on the way, right? Yeah. Uh, from due, due to inactivity and it and but what I like is that it creates a dynamic situation out of it. It makes le it makes lemonade out of lemons, or as Tito Ortiz would say, it makes lemons out of lemonade. <laughs> 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 Numbers nothing but an age, Brian. Right. <laughs> yeah, I think I I I think yeah, we definitely in agreement with that. I mean, it, it's 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 really just ridiculous, and it it, it really hurts. I think overall. The, the sport on a whole. Uh, so I'm hoping that's something that uh, they get away from moving forward. So um, that is all that we have for you today on at me, bro. Uh, I appreciate everybody watching. We appreciate everybody watching again. If you dig what you see and dig what you hear, make sure that you like and uh, um, subscribe and also make sure you share the video so that we can continue to grow that sub count. So and huge thanks to you guys for the um, for the extra subs and, and crossing that milestone yep. uh, on and upward. We, we know you guys are going to continue to support. And I have a podcast uh, with Doc Coyle talking about the Anthony Davis situation. Doc awesome. Coyle is the guitar player from Bad Wolves, but he's also been writing about and covering NBA stuff for a long time. He's a huge fan. Um, Bad Wolves recently had like, I think, I don't know what the top number was, but at one point they had the number one album in like 17 countries. So shout outs to Doc for all of that, that stuff. He does a lot of great podcast work on the, um, well, I think it's Jabber Jaw Media Network or something like that. Uh, okay. But yeah, look for Doc on Twitter at Doc Coyle and that discussion will be there. And on that show, of course, I am plugging at me, bro, as well. So thanks for all of you who catch that. All right. Sounds good. All right. So uh, I'll be, uh, like I said, we appreciate you watching as always. God bless and peace.